Hello. Good morning, everybody. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Welcome to this early morning full Hello. of knowledge, expertise, and real life project stories. I see the counter is still counting up. We are at 111 participants now. I think we have some 200 plus people who signed up who might join a bit later even. So welcome everybody. I hope uh, that you can hear me well at this uh, conference. Welcome uh, to the symposium on uh, climate resilient green and nature inclusive cities, uh, which is organized by uh, BOCO, uh, the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna and Biotope City Foundation, Biotope City Vienna and Amsterdam, of which we have also some uh, fantastic speakers here today. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. I see the counter is still uh, going up. Um, welcome to this morning full of expertise and I think cutting edge science, maybe the most relevant at the moment when it comes to nature inclusive and green cities. Um, I'm Matthias Lehner and I'm very happy to be the moderator of this conference here uh, this morning. Um, I'm an architect uh, by training and I have studied in Vienna. So it feels really good to be connected with so many people also from Boko in uh, Vienna here this morning. But I'm living in Amsterdam now and I uh, have founded the Next City, a platform for nature inclusive and biodiverse cities in oh, yeah, no. 2014, which is uh, more or less 10 years after Biodope City was founded. And uh, I don't know, maybe you saw it also on the LinkedIn or something. Uh, we also have a little booklet, the first guide to uh, nature inclusive design. And uh, that has been available in Dutch and English. And we're talking about a German version of that as well. And um, this is really a topic that goes to my heart. Uh, it goes about cities, about ecosystem services, about living together with life. And I was very uh, honored uh, to be asked by uh, Helga Fassbinder and uh, Harry van Helmond from Biotope City to moderate this conference here this morning. So thanks for that. And I wish us all a really, really insightful and uh, interactive online conference. I don't know how it's in your country, in Holland. We could meet up again from next week on uh, live. But um, in a way, we are all probably Zoom or Teams or whatever naturals by now. So welcome to this online event, which you can comfortably take part in with your own coffee in your seat at home or at the office or where you are. So welcome again. Maybe some uh, logistics. Uh, we have at least in the right, no, left upper corner of my screen, we have uh, Irene and Uli from Boku in Vienna. Uh, that's the two girls waving. Hello, good morning. They have, of course, some plants in the background, as many of you have. Yeah, very good. Very nature inclusive. And um, uh, they will watch the time of this uh, tightly filled morning today. And we have 12 excellent speakers for you today, each 10 minutes, so very briefly. And Uli and Irene will also, like if you're a speaker, um, remind you about the time scheme when necessary. Also, Irene and Uli will moderate the chat. So we would like to encourage uh, interaction, but please write your question in the chat while or after the presentation and Irene and Uli will pick out some questions which we will then ask to the speakers. Yes, I think that's more or less it. As you found out by myself speaking English, not Dutch or German, uh, this is a really international conference and uh, it will be recorded uh, and it can be 
uh, looked at after this conference. Uh, you can watch it and uh, share it uh, with your colleagues. And uh, so we hope that the knowledge we uh, compiled here today or Biotop City and Vocal compiled here today is accessible for much longer and reach many more peoples. We are now at 128, as you can see. Zoom is very truthful about that. So you cannot say you really know how many people have been participating. But first of all, also we had a little preparation meeting this morning. People said, oh, where are all the people coming from actually joining this conference? So please use your chat function and write the country where you come from, just right in there. And then we ask Irene and Uli what we have here. Do you know the chat function down there? Ah, there, wow, it's going fast. Ooh. Yeah, Irene, I see you laugh. You have to do a speed reading course, of course. So where are the most people coming from, Irene, Uli? Tell us. Here we, are we, have? Oh, yeah. we are a lot of people from Germany and Austria, also from the Netherlands. I picked up one Greece option and France, um, but I think mostly it Italy, I also oh, yeah. saw. So a very uh, entire pan-European conference. Yeah. Sweden, we saw Sweden. Ah, very good. Thank you very much. And then, of course, um, I'm an architect, and many of you, are, of you are maybe designers or ecologists or scientists. What is your profession linking to this conference? Please write in the chat your profession. Ah, I see. Wow, you're very, you had all coffee this morning. You're in a very interactive mood. Very good. Ah, I see also students. Irene, Uli, what do we have? Wow, still going on, counting, counting. So let us know. Um, there are landscape planners, landscape gardeners, junior researchers, architects, artists, um environmental engineer human ecology um so many different a professor is also here um someone from the government there are some students and i see somebody saying human being i like that that's a yeah good thing here. <laughs> great but, but we don't have anyone saying animal or plant huh? so we're, we're not there yet we have to work on some more. So this is, of course, not the first. Thank you for letting us know, uh, uh, people. This is, uh, of course, not the first conference uh, that was uh, organized by Biotope City. But it's, um, and can I please ask you to switch off the microphone? Thank you very much. This is not the first conference organized by Biotope City. I think uh, Helga Fassbinder, our first speaker uh, today, uh, she organized already 20 years ago the first conference after she developed uh, the concept of uh, Biotope City. And now we are 20 years in it uh, further. And I remember when we did the first conference with Next City some seven, eight years ago, at least within the architect um, community, it was a little bit strange to design for plants and animals. So I see you nod, Helga. I can imagine maybe 20 years ago, it must have been even more... Uh, interesting uh, to get the reactions of your colleagues that you are asking attention for something um, very different we have not heard before. And you did that, of course, not only with the Biotope City, you have been a professor also in Eindhoven and, and in Hamburg, and you have advised the city of Amsterdam. And um, I think one of the reasons why we have this conference timed exactly now is because something very special has happened recently. Not only is the foundation uh, Biotope City uh, here almost for 20 years, no, uh, there is a whole neighborhood with the same name uh, built uh, in Vienna together with uh, architect Harry Glück. And I think it took uh, you more than 10 years to prepare this project. And of course, uh, we are very, very excited to, to hear from you what are the, the theory and, of course, the practice of Biotope City, especially uh, with the project now in Vienna being opened and I think inhabited by 3,000 people. So Helga, please 
very warm welcome to this conference as our first uh, keynote speaker. Please uh, share your screen and tell us more about Biotope City. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Well, I hope this works. Oh, no, it doesn't share. Ah, perfect. We see your screen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. Full screen. Perfect. Go ahead. Oh, well, I start. Some weeks ago, these two reports were published on climate change and biodiversity. Official results of research of 195 countries. The reports indicate the danger of fundamentally, uh, fundamentally changed conditions for life on Earth. And this concerns architecture and urban planning as well. We cannot go on with business as usual. The building construction sector is a made up polluter. What to do? We cannot stop building housing shortage and migration and the population explosion. The concept of Biotope City is reflecting this. The basic uh, philosophy of the Biotope City concept says the city is embedded in the complex interrelationship of nature. It means the city is not an antithesis of nature, but it's one of its manifestations. The dense city is a type of nature. What does this mean in building activities? Here you have a list of measures be carried out and you will hear more about this on this symposium now. But we, before we take this step, I want to talk a bit more about what the core of the concept of Biotopsity is. To understand the core is very important for all people engaged in planning and building it, because we are talking about a whole network of measures. This is a highly complex process. Hundreds of people are working on a larger project. And at many points, they have to do things differently than they are used to do. They have to understand why. This is really essential for the success of a project. In the Biotop City, Wiener Belt, this was the case. Everyone was ultimately fulfilled by the concept, even down to the construction workers. They talked about building the spirit of Biotop City and they were proud of on it. So what is the concept of Biotop City? Biotop City takes the next steps from sustainability by using the regenerative forces of nature. You, uh, this little graphic, you may remind on what you have learn learned at school long ago, perhaps about plants. They play a central role. Let's look back in history of life on earth. What are our living conditions as humans? We as vertebrates can only live in a very narrow spectrum of conditions concerning temperature, humidity and air. We have to recognize plants are makers of our breathable air. Leaf green plays a central role. Provocatively, one could say they are superior to us. The Italian French philosopher Emanuele Coccia has dedicated an entire book on this insight. He says, our philosophy puts Homo sapiens in the most important place in creation, but actually it's um, just the other way around. It's the plants on which everything depends. Plants can do much more than we can, and we are in a sense, parasites of their abilities. With 
as a, the plants only need sun and water for staying in life. With photosynthesis, they pro produce energy and food. We would like to be able to do this. They create own, their own soil with their own becoming and passing away. They regulate temperature by evaporation and they interact with other beings to get help for pollination and seed transport. Plant, plants do business with other species. They offer food in return. What can we learn from this? Oh, it, it has stopped going on with the sheet. What can I do? Hello. Can we use the cursor? Like the, the right uh, indicator, like the, the tab? I have or you move the cursor, yeah. But, and but, click. Yeah, but it, it doesn't work. Wenn du einfach nur die um, Tastatur nimmst mit einem Rechtsklick. Ja, ich habe hier keinen Rechtsklick. Nein, nur no, den Pfeil. This is working now. We, we are seeing the next slide with the leaves. Yeah, we, we see just the other slides as well. And, and so it is, is not such a, such a problem. Well, I said, what can we learn uh, uh, from, from the plants? But it's doing business with plants. And... Uh, uh, yeah, let's offer them living space and they offer us in return this list of, list of, uh, of uh, abilities. This is most important for us, but they even offer us more. Uh, they offer us in material for our buildings and build structures. And this concerns the trees, the wood. But plants need, yeah, they need unsealed soil and water and light. Cooperation with plants in the city means cohabitation and offering them space next to our buildings, next and off around the buildings, on the buildings, on the roofs, the facades. And yes, rethinking planning. And building for cohabitation with plants and their trees. This is city as nat nature. It improves biodiversity too. And it can help us solving our problems, negative effects of climate and biodiversity through building. And it makes possible to build without, or better, less climate uh, and environmental damaging consequences. My conclusion is we need a new social contract, a social contract with the world of plants. Now let's have a look at Biotop City, uh, Wiener Berg, a new quarter without cars, green cover as much as possible. It's on the former industrial plot of Coca-Cola, which was nearly 100% sealed. The data. Recording in progress. <laughs> Well, the, the, I, I only uh, name, uh, you can, can all re uh, read the, these details on the site of Biotop City Journal. I only want to underline it's very dense and 60% social housing. And uh, the whole process was guided and controlled by an advanced micro simulation of greening and its effects. The neighborhood <laughs> was, is in high density and at the same time, a high quality of life is really special. The measures here, short overview, recycling the demolition material 
sponge city, complete use of rainwater greening, ha habitats for biotope city, and the results are really smashing. 2.2 degrees lower air temperature and 23 degrees lower felt temp temperature. Well, now let's take a walk through Biotop City. 289 trees. They are not so big so far, but they will give shade in the summer and light and sun in the winter. Urban gardening. And facade green, the if effects are remarkable, up to 28 degrees cooler surfaces on buildings, and that is very important for in the night. Gardens for tenants and owners, or also for handicapped people, and of course, uh, green roofs, and on two of the um, flats in social housing, two swimming pools. These are the, last, uh, the, the most recent uh, photos from the roof. And there's a an, an restaurant with a view on the, on the natural pond for the overflow of rain, uh, heavy rain. Well, the project is awarded with the Green Pass Platinum here see, see the vice mayor of uh, Vienna proudly showing it. Well, the, I want to po point out two very important characteristics of the planning and implementation process. Very necessary is in the very beginning, a contract commitment of the main actors to the Biotop City concept, the investors, but also the architects and landscape architects, and of course the city have to declare their commitment. This is very important, more it is essential. And then a very useful is a microclimate simulation in all planning steps with regarding to greening the wind orientation in investment costs and maintenance costs. In the case of Biotop City Wiener Berg, we had an extraordinary chance to a scientific monetary by a multidisciplinary team under the lead of the BOKU and the Foundation Biotop City. The result of this was a manual, how to build a Biotop City. It's not yet available in English, we hope soon but it's already available in German and it is on the site of Biotop City Journal published and on the site of the Boku, the ELAP. By the way, for all the, those who do not really know the foundation Biotop City, it's a non-profit organization without any commercial interest with their activities, for instance, this symposium, it's based on people concerned about climate change and loss of biodiversity, as the young people are doing, who are on, in, just at this time, on the streets to, uh, today. We are on the Friday for future. I thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Helga, for, for this inspiring uh, view also of the Biotope City project and lining out the principles again. Um, I would like to ask um, uh, uh, maybe one or two questions and also sticking to the schedule, I uh, 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 would, however, invite the uh, audience also to maybe write some questions in the chat. Uh, but I think maybe 
two things I would like to refer to. You talked about density, it's a high density, uh, and I think also the pictures show that. Would you say that there is a limit or a constraint for the biotope uh, city concept when it comes to the relation with the amount of houses per square meter with the density in the city? Um, in, in, uh, the, in Austria and in, in Germany, one does not count the amount of uh, um, flats on a, on a square meter. Uh, one says it in GFZ, uh, Geschossflächen. Yeah. FSI, yeah, I get it, yeah, yeah. But is there a limit in density terms speaking to this concept? Oh no, it's just uh, a question of, of, um, of yeah, looking through by the planning, what is possible. I, I, it, it depends to completely from the situation. Uh, uh, planning in New York should be different from uh, something in, well, uh, in Delft of <laughs> where, where. So I, I, I should uh, say this is a discussion completely differently. They are um, um, missionals of low densities and others of, of high density, but it, it's, it is completely dependent on, on the demand of people. For instance, um, uh, housing to towers are often very good for, for singles. They, they like to live in such a situation, but families like to have a, a garden of a, of a big terrace. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And um, I think um, um, very interesting. And I think the image you are uh, uh, in my mind after your talk, of course, that uh, whatever New York as a nature inclusive city, I, I, I see something as one of the participants, Bernard Scharf, whom we will talk with in a minute, who has a comparable image already there. Maybe one final question to you, uh, Helga, because um, I was yesterday in Kerkebos. It's a, a very interesting new neighborhood in, in the Netherlands, uh, nature inclusive. Uh, 700 uh, social houses were replaced by, I think, 1,000, um, 1,100 1, uh, houses, social uh, rental, uh, but also uh, uh, individual owners. And uh, biodiversity has been increased. And the people who did the project said uh, it was uh, cheaper. Uh, than a project which would have been developed regularly, cheaper in building and cheaper in maintenance. And I remember also from my own practice, this is always an argument, of course, when you, uh, you talked about commitment and about the investor. Could you say something about cost from Wienerberg as far as we know that now? Um, the costs for, for such a project are limited by, by the government. Um, so, and it was not, uh, not more expensive than normal. Also, uh, even even uh, the cost for for the greening was within uh, li the limits. Okay, I think we are very curious for the uh, the, the handbook, which is uh, coming also in English, available on Biotope City, and. Um, um, uh, thank you very much for, for opening uh, this uh, symposium with this inspiring talk. I think um, given our tight schedule, Irene, we should move on to our next uh, part. I see some nodding there. Uh, so thank you very much, Helga, again, for, for opening uh, this symposium. And um, I, I read the question in the chat is, uh, how will the schedule of this conference be? If you haven't seen it online, we will have now a uh, uh, 10 presentations of 10 minutes each and there's uh, space for questions some five minutes to discuss with the speakers and all together uh, we will have and we'll end up with uh, uh, speaking about the floating university and I think after one hour we decided to have a short break um, so we'll give you also a little task to uh, uh, walk outside and then come back to us. And also after two hours, we'll have another short break. And then somewhere between 12.30 and 1, we'll go into discussion. And uh, at 1, at the latest, we'll end uh, this um, uh, program. Uh, I think it's online. But if you have some questions, just ask them in the chat. And Irene and Uli are happy to give you more details on the timing. 
So we uh, now move to the second part, which is uh, 10 talks of uh, basically all aspects that are relevant when it comes to climate uh, adaption, nature inclusivity, and greening the city. And our first uh, uh, speaker is uh, uh, Bernard Scharf uh, of Green for Cities. And he's also connected to the BOCO, the uh, University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences. And he is a landscape architect by origin, but has also uh, studied and um, uh, written a thesis, a promotion thesis on uh, plants in the city. And uh, we are very curious about his talk, uh, green cover effects, about the effects of planting or green infrastructure on the urban energy and water households. So Bernard, a very warm welcome to you at this symposium. And uh, the next 10 minutes, we're all uh, stuck to our screen to learning more about green cover effects. Please take it away. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Matthias. Uh, yeah, let's see what we can do with green in our cities and why it's so uh, important to use green. Let's have a look at our cities today. These are some pictures that I, I took from Vienna, but you can take these, the same pictures in Stuttgart and Berlin and wherever you go in Europe. Uh, you will find urban landscapes like this. So you can't see a lot of green, do you? So um, cities today are more similar to deserts, mineralic and dead, mostly. And uh, they are also not capable to deal with heavy rain events already. So that's very bad. Uh, but things are getting worse. Uh, the general secretary of the United Nations uh, called climate change the, the biggest challenge to human race ever. And here you can see a film from NASA that, uh, that shows how our blue planet turns to a yellow, orange, and red planet over a few decades from 1950 to 2014. So there is a dramatic shift in temperatures. And you can see that the land masses are affected over proportionally. That is very important uh, to realize that the, over the average temperature increase is not relevant for your city because you're on a, on a, on a country, you're on a land mass, and you're affected much more than the global average. Still, I would like to show you this. Uh, this is very well known, the different uh, scenarios of climate change. And some people ask, uh, are they accurate? Are these prognoses accurate? Do, do they really match the real, the real uh, developments? And they do. If you look at the right figure and the black line, you can see the historical emissions on the, in the first place and the prognosis until 2014. And they perfectly match what we call the business as usual scenario. That means that uh, nobody does anything about climate change. This is reality. Uh, the uh, global community fails completely on, on climate mitigation, climate change mitigation. And that means um, that climate adaptation uh, becomes uh, evidently even more urgent and more important than ever before, because we need to adapt to the future scenarios, which are not very um, optimistic. Um, so, uh, but what does it mean, the global uh, change to your, to your city where you live or your um, surrounding? Um, here is a study from the ETH Zürich from 2019, and they show the heat extremes of so the hottest days in the summer in 2050 that may reach highs of more than 45 degrees in the shadow in Vienna. So plus seven compared to today in Berlin and in Paris and in London, you have approximately plus six degrees in the shade in the summer, also ending up with temperatures of 42 to 45 degrees Celsius. This year we had on, in Malta, um, uh, highest value was 49 degrees in the shade in Malta this year. So at 30 years and you will have this in your hometown probably. How can you find out how your future is going to be? I recommend this web page from the European Commission from Copernicus, the climate analogues. You type in uh, the name of your city and you can see where it will end up in the next decades. Very interesting tool. So um, we have cities that are not fit for the future, that are not climate proof today. And we have climate change and we have uh, city growth. So what is the solution to cope with this challenge uh, and um, the negative effects uh, on our personal life, on our health and our economy? And the answer is quite simple for me as a landscape architect and scientist. 
it's plants. Uh, this is taken from the rooftop of the Biotope City. And it's also beautiful, actually. So there's a lot of ecosystem services derived by plants. Helga mentioned some. If you want to have a com comprehensive list, look at the TEEP uh, uh, publication on ecosystem services. So you may ask, why plants? Because they are unique, of course. And I want to show you uh, the impact of plants now on the um, urban energy balance first, and then on the urban water balance. So to give you a better understanding that this is nothing funny or something uh, people who love plants say, but this is physics. It's about physics and this is how it works. And the physical, uh, the, uh, the processes and the, um, the, the processes of physics are quite fixed and we cannot really change them. So what, is, what are the processes involved in the energy balance? You have the sun. The sun is the main driver of, of all uh, Earth's living but also of the climate system, basically. And if the sunlight hits the surface, certain processes occur, like the reflection or albedo, as we call it, the absorption of the energy. And unique to plants, we have photosynthesis, we have evapotranspiration and latent heat emission, which can also be done by, by water bodies. Uh, sensible heat emission, heat storage, and heat flux. These are the processes that occur when sunlight reaches the surface of a city, for instance. And there is a big difference between, uh, well, no. So there is a short lag, sorry for that. Let's look at the effects of uh, albedo. Uh, so the reflection of the sunlight. The sunlight is coming in, and if you look at the, or at the green and the pink lines, this is the reflection of green roofs. So green roofs reflect something between 10 and 20% of the incoming solar irradiance. Um, while gravel and bitumen foil react differently. So 80% of the energy are taken by the green roof. Let's see where the energy goes. Energy is never gone, it's just somewhere else. It's like, uh, like with the finance market. Uh, money is never gone, just somebody else possesses it. Uh, so where's the energy? Let's see here uh, a, um, a comparison of the building envelope temperature on the top right figure you can see the temperature underneath a sheet metal roof, it reaches up to 70 degrees. Uh, so very bad for the building envelope. And underneath an extensive green roof with 12 centimeters in height, you have only uh, 47 degrees in maximum. So uh, more than 20 degrees difference. Um, so the energy is not transported to the building envelope totally. Then it must be somewhere else. So remember 80% are taken picked up by the, by the green roof. Some energy is transported to the building envelope, but much less than with regular um, roofings. Uh, so, and this is where you can see where the energy is gone. It's the evapotranspiration. Uh, this is a project where we measured the real re relative humidity in front of a living wall system. And what you can see here is that uh, the relative humidity is increased significantly in comparison uh, to the relative humidity in front of a rendered facade or uh, the climatic background. You can see in the x-axis, the horizontal axis, the air temperature. So the higher the air temperature, the higher the relative humidity uh, will raise in front of um, the living wall. What does that mean? It means that the living wall, so I need to switch the slide. It has a timely delay. Yes, now it's there. Um, it means that the plants cool themselves because if you transfer um, water from the fluid to the gas form, you use a lot of energy and this energy cools down the surrounding. That means that plants always remain at the air temperature or below, while mineralic uh, materials like rendered facades, asphalt, concrete, roof tiles um, from brick, whatever, they store energy and heat up massively. This is a problem for the urban heat islands and the tropical night situation that we face. Um, so here the comparison. Um, and depending on the surface temperature, these materials emit heat to the city. So, so we emit heat, so skip here. Here you can see the heat storage and the heat flux of a, green, uh, of a facade greening again. Uh, the measurements on the municipality department of uh, Vienna 48. 
Um, on the left hand side, you can see the temperature of the wall behind the living wall in green and without living wall, without green protection, the rendered facade. And again, you can see a massive uh, difference uh, of up to 17 degrees Celsius. It's the same wall, the same building, the same time. 17 degrees Celsius less material temperature in the wall. And on the right hand side, you can see the energy transported to the inside of the building. Uh, the heat flux. And you can see that without living wall, you have up to 60 watts per square meter of energy transported to the indoors, uh, while with the living wall, you have something like um, 0 to, 20, to 15 watts per square meter at the same time. So a lot of energy is not given to the indoors. It's not emitted to the, to the city. It's just used for photosynthesis and evapotranspiration and uh, cooling, basically, the surrounding. Let's go to the effects on the water balance. Uh, Bernard, uh, sorry I, to interrupt. Yes. Uh, can you come uh, to a conclusion given our very tight uh, schedule? Yeah. So I think there is a presentation about Sponge City anyways later on. Uh, let's go to the relevance. How relevant are these effects? If you, if you upscale or ex extrapolate the effects of greening on uh, the urban area as a whole, like the perimeter block, which is the predominant urban typology in Vienna, uh, you can calculate based on the findings that I showed before the impact uh, on the city of Vienna for the first third and, and so on for the districts with the perimeter block. You can see them here on the left hand side. So with uh, on only one hot day, you save 1.6 million of kilowatts of energy that are transformed by the plants. You can save 154 cubic meters of water runoff into the sewer system with one rain event only. And if you do a maximum greening uh, of the city, uh, it's even much more. So there is a significant effect that green can derive for your city and make it fit for the future climate proof. And in the end, it's about the humans. So we, we as, as, um, as Helga mentioned before, we need a surrounding that fits our physi physiological needs. Uh, the bio-human bio metrolog metrology defines it as physical equivalent temperature and we can only achieve this if we react uh, with uh, effective greenery in the city to really manage our energy system and water balance. So this uh, so much, so quick from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention and looking forward to any questions that may have arisen in the last 12 minutes. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, this was really a, a high pressure cooker course into uh, physics and, and uh, uh, temperature household of cities and uh, energy flows. Thank you very much for explaining this to us. You also said, um, uh, at the end you said, but it's coming down to, uh, to us humans also and the environment of our humans. And uh, we'll look into interaction with humans with the next speaker in a minute when we talk about participation. But first, let, let me ask you one question and I invite the audience, of course, to put some questions in the chat uh, to ask uh, to Bernhard. Um, when it comes to plants in, in the practical experience, it's um, I think there is one part is the designing of, of them and the planting them, getting them financed. But then um, after everybody has gone and a normal life has uh, returned, maintenance is a, is a crucial issue, I think, also for the performance of the plants. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about that? The maintenance, of course. Yes. Uh, so the maintenance depends always on uh, the aesthetics that I expect from, from green. So if I want to have a perfect English turf, it's a high maintenance thing. If I do have a flowering lawn, like, like we suggested for the Biotope City and which is uh, realized there, you have only one or two mowings a year. So by the, it, you, you, you increase biodiversity, you reduce maintenance costs at the same time. And the aesthetics of a flowering turf or lawn is much higher than that of an English turf. So uh, using uh, the mechanisms of biodiversity also can end up with a lower maintenance cost. Yeah, this is, I think, also a couple of examples in the Netherlands show, show into that direction. Mm -hmm. I see one question from the chat, I think, Irene, but, and Uli, maybe you also want to point out another one. But um, as you're such a tech guy with the graphics and useful tools, um, there's a question, is there a tool how to calculate the extrapolation of these effects? Oh, yes, I think there is a presentation later on that will okay. show that. So we'll see more of that. 
Uh, any other question from the chat, Uli or Irene, which you would like to point out here? I have not seen any other questions. Okay, perfect. Then thank you very much, Bernard, again uh, for your presentation and taking us into the technicalities and practical uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of physics, also when it comes to nature inclusive uh, building. Thank you very much again. As said before, we'll right go on to our next speaker um, who will talk about uh, participation and about the interaction with uh, us humans. We'll uh, talk to Angelique Bellemarkas. She's from Inbo Architects, and um, uh, Inbo is a, a Dutch architecture firm, and she will. Um, I think show a video first about the project called Stripe S in Eindhoven, which actually was designed in uh, participation with the future tenants. Um, so we'll see, I think, a video in a minute, maybe shortly about Angelique. Uh, she's uh, not an architect, actually, but somebody who's working in, in uh, social welfare. And uh, she's also uh, involved in the Brainport Eindhoven and the Smart District in Helmond in the east of the Netherlands, and has always been uh, curious to work with parties that not normally would collaborate or know each other. And I think this can be very beneficial when it comes to a concept like Biotope City. So let's have a look at the video first and then go into discussion with Angelique. Irene, are we ready to show the video? Do we also have the sound? Irene, could we have the sound? Irene and Uli, I think there is sound in the video and we cannot hear it. Can you check again, please? Dear friends at uh, Boku, I think uh, the suggestion is to restart and reshare the screen. So let's try to do this again with the sound. And uh, it would be nice also to hear the people talking. So sorry, audience, for this little technicalities. I think we did a tryout this morning, but even computers sometimes don't collaborate the way we want. They Could we try again? They will talk in, in Dutch. and. Uh, Everything is underlined in uh, English. Perhaps it's it's sufficient. Angelique. Yes. There there should be sound, right? Yes, there's really there's sound, and I even think it's uh, English. People yeah. are talking English. So it would be yes, nice to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to tell famous. us everything we didn't hear, Angelique, of course. Ah, I, I hope people can read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear, dear, dear people of Boku, can we try again and have the video with sound? It's five minutes, so we are all good with the schedule still. Okay, we are trying it again. Good luck. <laughs> No, not again. Not working. No, no, no. And maybe we can send it to people. 
Yeah, that was my suggestion as well. We will put it in the chat, the link. And yeah. Yeah. Put the, it's, it's a YouTube movie indeed of five minutes. Yeah. Um, so if you put it in the chat, I think the audience can uh, click on it and have a look. And it's five minutes 57. So can you copy the link in the chat? Ah, okay, no, nothing is um, working anymore. Um, but uh, Angelique, do you have the link and could you put it in the chat, please? <laughs> okay, I will try, yes. Uh, I see the link has uh, yes, shown up yeah. by Raphael. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. So um, I would suggest that you uh, click to the link, uh, dear visitors. We are actually 162 at the moment. We'll test YouTube now to the best. If 160 people look the same, uh, watching the same video. And then Angelique will, will talk in five minutes. So please have a look on your device and we'll talk in five minutes.
So Angelique, I guess uh, most of the audience has seen the video, so oh, that's I very guess. nice. Then you know what space S is for a little bit. Yes. Okay, we are back here in the in the main auditorium, so to speak, uh, from our breakout session to our own YouTube screen. I think mostly. So. Um, uh, I hope that worked well for you. The link is there, so everybody's ready. And uh, Angelique, uh, um, this is of course a very special project. And um, uh, I, I talked also to your colleague Aaron earlier, and he said, uh, and you didn't show it in the video, uh, but uh, he said um, the participation really involved people building building blocks like a big Lego and defining spaces, uh, what the sizes are. And at the end, the people said, but we designed it. It's not the architect. <laughs> yes, I think it's really true. Because there was in the beginning, there was a different plan. And we asked people, the first, the first sentence of the, maybe the first important question is, how do you want to live? And from that on, you, you have to think, what do I need at space? Or how will I, uh, my house, which space do you want in my house? So the first question is really, how do I want to live? with myself, with my neighbors. So that's very important. And I think really they designed the, the houses and the blocks because for in, the, in the beginning there were two blocks and at the end we had seven because people wanted spaces between you want walk through the blocks. A little yes, bit so mysterious maybe. So the design yeah. really changed due to participation. But, and I also heard that um, people say, um, like it feels like on vacation, it's like a built happiness, uh, but this has not been like a, a target on its own, but uh, that's the feedback uh, that you're uh, getting from the audience, which is of course perfect. But when we talk about nature inclusivity and, and climate adaptation, why do you think is this co-creation process even more important uh, today? Because I think we get other solutions. When you look at social housing, uh, housing companies, they maintain a lot of, of buildings, houses, and they will change. We get other materials, we get other things. And I think the most important thing is that people understand why we choose materials or why uh, uh, the solutions are different. And if you want it, they use them, they have to understand why. And I think their solution are technical, no problem, but it's really important that people accept them because you can build a neighborhood without a car in it. But when somebody thinks I need a car in front of my door, then you are gone. And I think now uh, we have a, a lot to do in our society. And when, I, when you talk with people, then you talk all about how they want to live. But you also talking with people who are alone. They need other people. And when you talk, then you get solutions at the same time so you can cover more problems. So now, and I think the, the, the change what we are doing now, it's really, really important to do it with the people who go to live in the neighborhoods, to use the houses, because it's really different. Yeah, and in the video, it was also rem uh, remembered that, uh, as we know in Holland, of course, there, there is one million houses to be built within a very short period, uh, as yeah. uh, one of the uh, people interviewed also mentioned. Um, and this took a little bit longer, we heard, but um, it would be, of course, an ideal blueprint to do these, these projects much more often. And is there a lot yeah. of 
copycats by other architects? Does your office do more projects like these? Do you get many invitations to do this kind of project? No, 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 we not, no, we not get many invitations. We have a lot of projects, but we, I think we get more. We need to have more, not for our, uh, for Imbo or for the other architects. We need it for the society because you can solve a lot of problems at once. And people can, when, when people meet each other, see each other, different things will uh, happening. And it's not only the people who are maybe vulnerable, but also the expats who are coming to your city to, to live there. They want also to meet other people. So it's, it's really uh, important. But I think what is difficult, um, that's your own ego and maybe your own organization because you have a lot of principles in your organization. And when, you can, when you're you going to do in co-creation, you have another process. And I think maybe is that a little bit problem? And people always think, I hear it a lot also for people who develop neighborhoods, they say, well, yeah, when you ask, when you ask people, how do you want to live? They all come with the swimming pool and then they cannot afford it. And everybody wants to have very expensive things. But that is bullshit, because when you say to people, you can have this solution, but that will cost you this, then they really, they say really, okay, that, that's not for me, I want another solution. Yeah. So it's... I, I think uh, that's uh, interesting also to hear, and there's learnings from that, and there's not so much follow-up now, also other offices, not in this I think degree. more, we get more and more, and now uh, we have the project together, uh, in, in, in this month, what is saying a lot about uh, collaborative housing. So it's, yeah. I think it's really uh, uh, necessary. Yeah. And is there, is there anything you could share about the participation process? There's also one in the questions in the chat I see. Is, is there something you could share with other housing corporations or architects yes, about the participation process? Yes, yes, because we make a book about yeah. Space S, because when you're going to ask people, how do you want to live, you have to do um other meetings you cannot say with a powerpoint presentation so you do a lot of other things so we build really uh, houses um with blocks um at one at one so people could see okay this is how big is my living room okay this is my toilet so you get a few you have to be creative and yeah. we made a book of it is the book already available yes but it's in dutch okay is it online or a real book it's uh, online. I can send it. Yeah, I will send it to you. Yeah. Please, please put the link in the chat. And yeah. if it's online, I think Google Translate, it, I think even, well, well, we'll, we'll see what Google yeah. Translate can help us if we don't speak Dutch. Otherwise, just learn Dutch, of course. Yeah. Maybe yeah. a final question, uh, Angelique, to you before we move on to uh, uh, Malice, our next speaker, also an architect. Um, this is an unprecedented project, we honestly can say that. I think this form of participation intensity hasn't been seen uh, before. Uh, is there something like a next level, Stripe S? What would be a yes. next step for you as a company? For me, it's the next step that we are going to build neighborhoods, not in the beginning with a program, but that we bring people together. And from that point, you go, you, you have to watch what people need and it's not, only going about to live together, but also to work, to learn, to go to school. So we get not only a mix by people, but also a mix by function. And that's difficult because in the Netherlands, at the beginning, everything is yeah, organized. So you get a program. You have to do so many houses, so many this and that. And I think we have to make a step further, not at the beginning a program, but step by step. Uh, design the program with the people who want to join, who want to live there or share the space. So designing also the design brief together with the people yeah. who will live or work there. I think yeah. that's an inspiring uh, thought to, to continue working on also with Imbo. And I, I'm very curious yeah. uh, what the next projects will be. Thank you very much, Angelique. Uh, sorry for the tech mishap. We tried everything, but still, but uh, luckily everybody's online, obviously, yeah. and can see the video on themselves. Um, thanks again, Angelique. I think very inspiring. Also, I see in the comment uh, in the chat. And uh, please include the link for the, yeah, even if it's book. Dutch, uh, uh, yeah. the book you were talking about. Thanks yes. again. We are moving to our next speaker, Malisa Zuidam from Farm Architects in Eindhoven. And uh, she will talk about uh, 
uh, inclusion of fauna and nature in the projects and about regenerative design, of course, within the Netherlands to reach a climate robust and uh, uh, nature inclusive building, which we need, of course, in this uh, country close to the sea and partly below sea level. So I want to say a very warm welcome to Malise. Um, are you there? Hi. Yeah, I think the technical problems are going on because we cannot reach Malise. <laughs> I see her in the picture here. Hi, ah, Malise. Yeah, okay. you're there. Can uh, you switch off? Can you unmute your microphone? Uh, and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to do that. Where is she? Ah. Ah. M. Dot Zuidam, Zuidam in that in German. Yes. So now you should be able to do that. Malise. Yeah. Morning. Hey, we can hear you morning. now. Morning. Perfect. Good morning. Okay. I only saw that you have to unmute me, so that's why I couldn't speak. Yeah. Hello. Um, shall I start and share yes, my screen? Yes, uh, please. You prepared the presentation, so share yes, your screen, and we are curious to hear about your regenerative design practice and the inclusion of fauna. Okay, can you see my screen right now? Perfectly well. Yes, yes. okay, great. Um, Molly Seidel, I'm uh, uh, with Ar uh, FAM Architects and um, together with Tom van Tijn Sedema, we work on a lot of regenerative uh, design projects. Um, we have um, tried to, um, oh, sorry, I see myself too much. Let's see if I can switch this off. Um, we have tried to, um, Sorry, also some technical things. Yes, that's bad. Um, we uh, try, we do a lot of um, area developments and building assignments uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so sorry for my English because I'm not used to doing this uh, talk in, uh, in English. Um, and we, uh, I think about six, five, six years ago, we uh, saw that we need to do a bit, a, a few things, actually a lot of things different in our uh, office with designing, uh, especially aerial, aerial developments, but also the building. Uh, and then we started to think over regenerative ontwerpen, as we call it. And we try to, in this uh, um, way of designing, we try to implement ecological systems uh, at the area and on building level, uh, and it's central for uh, regenerative design. We try to incorporate nature and environment uh, and social aspects into building plans. Um, uh, and that means that we try to uh, at least get on the same level uh, in biodiversity and nature with projects uh, as it is in front of the project, in front of the start of the project. But of course, we mostly try to get it better, to get a better level, uh, to bring something with the project. Um, I'm going to show you steps we use um, uh, to uh, try to um, implement this in our work. So you see a lot of, pro of projects. I won't get into the project, but I will uh, take uh, you uh, with the steps we try to take in our designing. Um, like I just said, the traditional thinking uh, we used to do is that we had a plot, then we started thinking over a building, and then we thought, oh God, there's ecological uh, systems around it, we have to implement them in the building. Afterwards, we had designed the building. Actually, I think that most architects, uh, unfortunately, still do it this way. What we now try to do is we try to say, okay, we have a location, let's think over what's there already in flora and fauna, and um, uh, design after knowing what's happening in the in the area and implementing it immediately in your design. So we start with designing immediately with the ecological things are given by uh, biodiversity and things. And uh, then we get a building which is integrated in the landscape better and uh, where we implement uh, nature inclusivity more of better than we, we used to do that. And that's what we call regulative ontwerpen. Um, we also um, have a few, um, uh, call it uh, teams we uh, work with to also have a sp uh, to speak with our contractor about uh, the design, uh, um, uh, the way of designing and implementing these subject in our design. And actually, the scheme you see here on the uh, right side or on the left side, I'm sorry, um, is what the regulation in Holland asks for and we try to make visible what we are doing in a project on the on the left side so the more blue the circle gets the better we um, actually uh, do uh, the better the project is 
Um, why should we do that? Well, we, we hear that in every news uh, item uh, these days, so we all know why we should do it. But what we see is that the policy in Holland, at least, and I think it's worldwide a problem, is that it focuses a lot on CO3, uh, CO2 reduction. And of course, that's very important because we should really be aware that we, and we should uh, get things uh, done in this way. But it's not the only solution. We also should talk about what we're talking today, about a lot of more green in the environment. And it will solve a, a lot of problem, problems uh, uh, we are um, uh, seeing in the news uh, every day. So, uh, and this is why we actually started with Regenerative Ontwerp in the first, uh, at first. Um, actually, Helga already told it, we're mostly thinking in this way, but we should think in this uh, eco way, where the human is in the middle of the ecosystem and not on top, because we're not on top. And this is a very nice image we use a lot to explain um, uh, that we try to look at uh, our project this way. How do we do this? And I will take you in steps. It starts, of course, with a team. Um, the client, um, uh, nowadays we get assignments uh, in this way and people ask us for this approach. But um, if they're not asking us for this approach, we try to communicate with our client about this in the start before we put any line on paper. And what is a very dif uh, different uh, thing, I think, what we, um, what is the most biggest difference is that we uh, try to attract, the, uh, uh, try to get the ecologist immediately in the team. So uh, before we start designing, we are speaking to ecologists of what's happening in the surrounding and what is good and what is not good for this area and what should we improve or what is something which is not working right now and what could we do better. And of course, it's about integral, uh, an integral process. So everybody needs to join from the start. And that's also, uh, for, ex uh, for example, a landscape designer or an architect and an urban designer, but also um, the people around, like Angelique just, uh, just also uh, mentioned, a lot, talked about. Uh, we also think that it's very important to uh, implement uh, the social surroundings and people uh, who are going to use the buildings and live around the buildings or areas. Uh, where very work on. For us, it starts with thinking about plot limits, and that means that we try to make stepping stones. And that is that, for example, this project is actually around about five plots in this area, but we think a lot bigger. So we start with thinking about what is the uh, ecological surroundings or what is the nature which is the surrounding and where do we want to attach to. And then we try to get the uh, assignments we have, we try to think over the plot line. So we get a bigger project and we can do more on the, uh, we can add more green and the green we add will be more, uh, have more impulse. So this is a zoom in. And actually these are the plots we use, but we're talking now with the municipality about this area and even a bigger part. So uh, you see that it's uh, um, the Marlies, few buildings. Yes. Excuse me uh, to interrupt you, uh, to be impolite. We have a very tight scheme and I just yeah. wanted to say that we are a bit far uh, in the presentation, almost half, it's more than halfway. And I see that you okay. still have many slides to go. So yes, I will go quicker. Let us keep uh, on track yeah. with the scheme and follow you. Thank you. Yes, good. Um, well, like said, we start with uh, also um, knowing the uh, environment uh, in flora and fauna and that we do in this way. So we make a, a poster about the soil and everything which is uh, um, um, uh, necessary to uh, look good at the biodiversity and eco ecological situation of a, um, of a project. The next step is to make an ecological concept. So we have a building concept or an area concept, but we also make an ecological concept. So we can talk with our clients about uh, what we are doing in a very simple way. Sorry, something's going wrong here. Uh, in a very simple way. And this also helps us communicate with municipalities easier than uh, talking only about the building uh, concept. We think about a lot about the buildings, making them smaller, making smaller private spaces like you see here and leave a lot of space open for nature and try to make that uh, uh, nature which is more important and the private space, keep it more to the house. So it's more part of the house. So you look at a different way of using the private outside space and make it more small so you have more space for, uh, for nature. Um, of course, it's also a lot about uh, the nature uh, of putting things in the building itself for animals, uh, for green roofs, uh, green walls and things like that and implementing water systems in the buildings we, uh, we design. 
What is also very important is the way of building. We do also a lot with um, wood buildings, uh, which has more uh, less impact in the floor and is built um, much quicker. So if you work in an eco ecological um, environment, uh, we think that it's the right way to build with other building systems. So also building systems has a lot of impact in your uh, in the surroundings for nature. Um, what's also important, and we just spoke about it, is involving stakeholders in your ideas, ideas to take them with you very easy, very early in the in the process. I wanted to tell a bit about this project, but I will skip it probably because it's too uh, long my story. Um, and what's nice to tell is that in this project we uh, actually it's a, a urban area design and we uh, put all the buildings with sticks in the floor and looked at the situation itself if it was okay what we were doing and this really had impact on the on the project and it's actually a method we want to use much more. And of course, um, it's very important to when the, the, the areas or building are finished to take the users with you in uh, explaining why, the, why you do the things or why the things are made like they are. Why is nature more wild than it's, uh, and it's not mold? Things like that. Because uh, if they understand why we did things, we can uh, make them enthusiastic and they will um, uh, embrace the idea and um, uh, work with us in uh, also using the area in the right way. I think it's very simple, no rocket science, we just have to do it. So uh, let's do nature inclusive design. Well, thank you very much, Malise, for uh, this uh, uh, call. Uh, uh, you're uh, actually not only inviting us, but strongly recommend to uh, do and participate in nature inclusive design. Um, I was uh, seeing uh, first reactions already in the chat, so very positive feedback. I wonder this regenerative design you were talking about when you are approached by a client and, and you tell them, yeah, but we do it like this. We try to include nature and so forth and so forth. What's the reaction of the clients to this approach? Well, uh, it used to be uh, difficult and why should we do that? We don't need for regulation or things, but now we see that uh, people are very open for it because of course uh, we have a lot of problems to solve and everybody reads and hears about it in the news. So um, it's much more easier for us now. Now we get questions to make uh, um, uh, climate robust areas, for example. So um, yeah, now it's, uh, it's common, it's more common, it's more easy. And we also notice that the diff most difficult thing for us is to get these things done also with governments. And we now also notice that they are very aware of the uh, problems we have to solve together and that we need each other. So they are also very open uh, minded now to work with us. It's only very difficult for them to, um, yeah, to go uh, past um, policy or things like that. So it's still very difficult to get it done. Yeah, yeah. In a and larger it, scale. I think we uh, also, like Helga said in the beginning, and I referred to it uh, like 10, 20 years ago when this idea of including nature came up, it was uh, especially also with, I think, the colleagues in our architecture field was like, these are a little bit strange people, what they are doing. And then we had this phase of a hype and a trend. And I think now we have a development which clearly shows us that this is here to stay because of the benefits yes. we need for the ecosystem and for climate adaptation. From your practice, is there maybe to conclude one, two, three lessons you learned, the top tips, no regrets you would, because we have many designers and architects also in the audience, which yeah. you would like to share. What, what is the golden tip you learned from your experience so far? Get good ecologists which can which can speak a bit our language in your team because that's important. What I mostly most difficult I think that we have to uh, get through is to that we all speak so many different languages in uh, in our professions and the integral uh, designing is very important. So the ecologist has to be on board very early, but it also has to be somebody who can. Um, think in another way that some ecologists think really small about uh, one fly or and that's also very difficult and um, yeah policy of course policy is also a big item we should yeah. uh, um, keep also um, um, well um, uh, asking governments to join us in this thinking because it's it's that's actually the most difficult right now 
Yeah, yeah. I recognize this, and I think many from us recognize this from the practice that the, the communication, the understanding each other, your first point is very valid. I remember talking to Stefano Boeri, whom I know from a park I designed with uh, Inside Outside in uh, Milan, when he designed the Bosco Verticale, he said, um, I had to learn that I have to take back my ideas so very much. I had to do less yeah. architecture. I had to give yes. space to others. And I think not being an ecologist, that also goes for the ecologist, of course, that it yeah. has been a, a co-creation, as we heard from Angelique before. Malise, many thanks for uh, uh, you again for this presentation. And um, we are almost on uh, schedule, ladies and gentlemen. But as we have uh, 12 speakers, uh, we uh, said we will have a little break uh, now after Malise. So I would say uh, we will meet at 10.30 back here in uh, uh, the the lecture hall, so to speak, but I would like to uh, give you some task. Meanwhile, first of all, don't check your email, don't watch the screen, stand up, move around, do some yoga pose, walk outside, stand on the balcony and take a picture of the first plant you will see. A tree, a grass, whatever, and as you are all a born Zoom natural, please change your background to the picture you took so that we see what's the first green aspect in your surroundings, a tree, grass, a flower, whatever. And please stand up, walk, breathe, stretch, and see you back at 10.30 here within the symposium. Have a good break.
Ja, das geht. Hello, everybody. 10.30. Maybe you would like to switch your camera on to show that you are back with us again after the short break. Uh, I see many people sitting up much more straight after the good stretching we had in these five minutes. And I see our next speaker already uh, uh, ready to present Maria Aubeck. I'll introduce you in a minute. So I hope you're back again. We are at 159 participants at the moment at this uh, symposium on nature inclusive green and climate adaptive cities organized by Boku uh, University and Biotope City. We are going into the second of uh, three parts of an hour full of expertise, knowledge, and recent scientific findings on this topic. And um, I see some green backgrounds already of some participants. Very nice, very nice. I see trees, I see a red flower at Heidi Manza, looks very beautiful. Very good. Jakob, entire tree landscape behind. Kilian doesn't have to take a picture. He has uh, plants right in his room. Uh, ah, Maria, you also show us your greenery outdoors. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this is truly, oh, Irene and Uli, you, you have somebody standing in front of you even. Very good, very good. I see. Um, uh, thank you very much for your interaction. And if you don't mind, send me one of the pictures. I would love to, maybe we can use it uh, for the uh, report of this conference. But let's continue because we have still a lot of interesting speakers uh, to go on. Ah, Florian, I see some grass. Aurora, Nicole, Fosa, hi, good to see you. Full in the greens, fantastic. Um, but let's continue um, um, with uh, our next speaker. Uh, Maria Auberg. Um, she is um, um, talking about building management and uh, open space care. We briefly addressed this aspect also of maintenance earlier, and we are curious to hear more of that. Uh, Maria is, uh, has been a professor in uh, Munich and uh, in Vienna, talking internationally about her work. Uh, her working field is art in public space, of course, landscape, architecture, and also gardening. And she's working with the office Auberg and Karas, if I uh, pronounce that correctly, I hope. And we are very curious to hear more about the building management and open space care by you in the next 10 minutes. So please, Maria, I hope you're unmuted, uh, share your screen and take it away after this green break. And they're very welcome to you joining us here. Uh, good morning to you all. I just like to say that I added some English words to the PowerPoint. So I would like to share my lecture with you. So some uh, English words are given for the ones who are uh, foreign or English speakers. Is that okay for you? Fantastic. Very yeah. good, Maria. Thank you. Okay. I wonder if you, you see my, my screen already, yes? Yes, so, we can see mm -hmm. it full screen. Perfect. Good, 
good. So due to the fact that this is a 10 minutes in input, I cannot speak about the whole of building management, um, but it is all a personal and a work uh, attitude. So uh, speaking about uh, building, it starts with the design, of course. You mentioned also my partner, Janusz Karas, and me working on uh, housing projects for many years. And I added this um, uh, artwork from Congo because it's all about patina. It's all about not the paper we make drawings on, it's all about the material that is exposed to nature, that material that is wear and tear of sunlight, rain, water, acid rain, you might call it today. And I would like to give you some ideas for your uh, discussion now. So I would like to go on to say it's all in a limbo. So it's uh, housing complexes, especially mass housing complexes, have their own rituals, laws, and ways how to uh, maintenance uh, organization is done. And it's a complete change from a personal care to an industrialistic uh, industry of uh, cleaning. Yeah? So what we really need is to think how the methods of garden maintenance should be adapted to whatever we heard today or will hear in this um, symposium. Uh, the holistic approach of maintenance has to be discussed. Is there any irrigation in future? And on the other side of the discussion, is there anybody interested to do composting? Already 20 years ago, I started to implement composting into Viennese housing projects. It was kind of difficult to make the managers make it understand. Also then I wanted to bring uh, bird feeders to the housing uh, uh, entrance gates. Not easy to make management people understand. So I think tenants have to take action. It's really the engagement. It's the uh, additional work of the people who are in the site, as we have heard it in the lecture before the, the break. Well, I added here that garden maintenance starts with the design. But who is responsible? So when we start on the building site, when the earthworks is uh, about to be changed, already it's a decision who is in charge of the good soil, who is selling the soil out of the land. So you arrive on the site and there's no soil given because it's sold out. So on the other side, there is the tools, there are the many maintenance um, reg regulations, and there is this tradition of garden maintenance, which is a 12 month a year management plan. And you need to have supervisors, you need to have people who guide the teams and make it a good complex project. So in uh, tradition, there was a change. So the maintenance of public spaces uh, has changed to be a tool driven maintenance, it's machines. So of course, today tree, tree climbing is very fashionable. But as you see here in one of our major uh, streets, Maria Hilferstraße in Vienna, the <clears throat> regular cut of the trees has to be done with big machines. And as you see on the uh, little images above, the security of the trees, it's, in, it's industry today. And for my, for my impression, architects and planners have to readjust. I did this photo in Munich several years ago of an office building where the architects thought the trees have to go under the buildings, but this tree will never experience rainwater. So I think it's a very artificial idea and maybe even a wrong design uh, solution to plant trees below buildings. Well, by tradition, there was a management plan per the year. So this is just an Im image to show you that from January to December, there is work that has to be done. And in these uh, garden management plans, 
uh, you can experience change of attitude, how you want to keep the lawn, be it a wild meadow or be it a cut lawn, but also do you want to have fruit trees or less fruit trees? So even today, the industry of uh, nurseries make uh, cherry trees without fruit. So you can plant them and they are not dirty any longer. Huh? So just imagine it's a start from the design. But also with the tools, tools have changed a lot. So there are new tools out and it's also a new profession. So I think it's a new acceptance of the gardening uh, culture profession needed to make um, ecological proof, to make it a work that the understanding is that the workmen, the workwoman on site, the gardeners have to be educated. In our country, there is no education of plant information any longer. It was cut out of the pedagogic programs because other image in, in other in content was more important. Just imagine garden workers without education of plant knowledge. No good. We have to go on and we have to reorganize education for gardeners. So this is unfortunately German now, but I will make it quick. Uh, I just wanted to uh, tell you that it's uh, uh, also besides the monthly maintenance, I. I said there is a yearly maintenance possible. And what we really need to do is the tree cutting because in the mass housing complexes, there is also the danger of being hit by dry um, uh, roots, uh, by, by, by dry branches. There is also the cut of the big shrubs and of the herbaceous borders. And of course, there is the question of how to deal with the weeding, with the natural lawns, and with the animal life. And of course, it's a question of how to maintain irrigation. And so in this case, when I look back, I give you now some images of housing complexes I was attached to. And just to tell you that up into these 50s, 60s, and 70s in Europe, it was very, very traditional to have gardener teams included in the mass housing management uh, on site. But now it's outsourcing. So starting around 90s and 2000 years, the outsourcing was very, very common. So I think today we have to team up with the tenants and we did it with some of the housing projects like car free housing and risk art housing in Munich, where the tenants started to do the maintenance. So I was living in Munich for some years and exactly as I, he said before, at, we're teaching at the academy there. I was living in Gewofak house with a garden maintenance team, which was part of the company of Gewofak. And they had to clean and to maintain the kindergartens, the courtyards. And I was looking into this courtyard for like this 12, 15 years, and there was a compost and there was an irrigation. When we did uh, the Caffrey housing estate, there was no longer in Vienna uh, a garden maintenance team on site. So the, uh, the tenants decided when we did this, it's four, uh, two courtyards and it's side gardens and it's six roof gardens. And I just show you now the site plan. And here you see the difference between 2000 and 2012, what happened with the uh, pond in the in the bamboo garden or in the, in the second courtyard. Well, there was a green group and they decided we do the maintenance. And we really had a lot of effort in this housing estate of 160 flats to have a green group by themselves. It did not end luckily because one of the guys, he really overdid his efforts. He was exhausted, yeah? It was the maintenance of these sites by themselves. It needs tools. You have to have machines, like you see the climbing plant. And now, 20 years later, the climbing plant you see up there, it was cut three months ago because there were mice up on the seventh floor. 
on the top of this uh, um, of this housing estate, you see the vegetable gardens, and they were implanted by the community, and they are very very successful. So I'm a bit critical about what managers think. Mice in the uh, fifth floor are dangerous, and tenants they want to have zucchinis, they want to have their tomatoes on the roof. So uh, the next housing project is Risk Art in English. It's Wagnis. It's the company's name. Imagine they call themselves Risk, really. And we are Risk number four. And so this was called Wagnis Art number four. And after an um, urbanistic competition of, of three uh, forms, of three varieties, the tenants decided to have the continents. It's from Europe to Africa, five buildings called after the continents of the world. They have two roof gardens, two inner courtyards. One is a wild meadow. One is a courtyard for meeting. And then they have a lot of side gardens. And all of this, again, was in the concept a bit more advanced. The major earthwork was done by a company. The tree plantings was done by a company. But the planting of the shrubs, of the herbaceous plants, of all the herbs, it was done by the tenants and I just like to show you here we had a discussion with the tenants and they were discussing the vegetable planting on the roof, which you see on the right is the vegetable roof. And we discussed who and how to do it. Even there was a decision for the staircases to make interior green, but I share this uh, not at this moment, I like to share with you the plant days. We did planting by tenants. It was in um, spring of 2018 and in the summer of 2019. And for all the tenants who were taking part, there were tools. The plants were brought in by the nurseries. And then when we had uh, the distribution uh, and then we had the work, there was coffee and cake for everybody. So then they, we did a manual for the maintenance. And in this, we have as well as... Uh, Maria, excuse yeah. me to interrupt you. I go um, on. Um, we are at um, 12 minutes and maybe we... You can go on, but then we cannot do some questions, which is good with me. But I'm uh, finishing. It's done. Yeah. I just wanted to say I started on the master plan and the preliminary design of Biotop City Vienna, and I'm looking forward to new projects. And this is the case for you now to ask for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Okay. Uh, I, I knew that you were coming to a conclusion, but um, thank you very much for uh, showing uh, uh, your experience with us. Maybe you want to unshare your screen. And um, um, I'm curious to uh, read the questions of the audience to Maria. So please use the chat and Uli and uh, Irene will help us ask Maria. The first question which I would like to ask you, Maria, is that you, of course, addressed the aspect of maintenance. And um, it's, a, it's a paradox in a way, I think. And maybe you can elaborate a bit about that. Because on the one hand side, there is many cities, for example, Breda, but also uh, others here in, in the Netherlands that actually could improve biodiversity by cutting maintenance uh, costs, for example, less mowing of the grass and stuff like that. So biodiversity and nature inclusivity as a result of actually having less money to spend. But then on the other hand, there is the designs that require machine cleaning or machine maintenance. And if it's not, it increases the costs. So how can you position uh, our profession and what can you give us as learnings from this paradox? Well, thank you. I, I just like to be quick and say, of course, life is a paradox. And that's <laughs> the interesting about it. Yeah. I just like to stress the point that for future education and information is the vital, it's the diamond of the life. Yeah. And if we go on to discuss who is getting work in Europe and who is distributing work in Europe, 
I think garden culture can only develop if there is knowledge in distribu distribution of knowledge. Now, concerning the tools, of course, this is the complex question of industrialization. But if you think about plumbing, electricity, uh, insulation, all of our building uh, partners are working on how to get the buildings less uh, oil driven and reducing all kind of as asbestos and all stuff of poison out. So in the gardening uh, culture, it's similar looking, and therefore I'm stressing the compost culture, looking for soil uh, protection and looking for good productive companies who understand that a new way of habit of garden uh, gardening is needed and i'm in in my age i'm i'm used to garden companies who are pushed down low in their business in the tenders reducing giving um, a discount that when they arrive on site, they are already tired, exhausted, and the tools are not given. Yeah. So I like to speak about give the money to the gardeners that you share with the whole of the building team. We say it's two to three percent of the netto building costs that landscaping is a budget. And that's no good. You have to rise the netto budget to give more impact on the surrounding of the housing estates. Well, we heard your call, Maria. Thank you very much. And I read in the chat the question, of course, that the, uh, main, uh, the manual you were mentioning, If is there something we could share with the audience? Is there a link or can you send it to the organization you were referring to? That would be very interesting, somebody says. And we have... Um, yeah. I, I love to do it, but only on the weekend because I have to run to the next meeting. <laughs> I won't be able to do it right now. Is this okay for you? This is unacceptable, Maria, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are looking forward to uh, receiving that uh, whenever you're ready uh, to do that. Thank you very much again for your contribution. And I see some signs also from the colleagues that we should move on to our next speaker. Thanks for joining us and enjoy your next conference. Um, I can understand completely with this expertise, you are a, a widely uh, looked for speaker. Um, we move on uh, right into our next and concrete uh, um, um, subject about urban climate trees and insect diversity and we will speak uh, with Brenda Swinkels of uh, von den uh, Berg Nurseries and Brenda we met earlier uh, I think two years ago in a conference on nature inclusivity in uh, Breda I think and that was an event where we thought we might be with 30 people then it turned out 70 then it turned out 120 and we had to reschedule a different large hall and which reminds me that we are still with 160 people joining us here today. So Brenda, I'm so curious what has happened since these two years. I remember flying trees, flying gardeners. We are very curious to hear more about the most recent findings from Vandenberg. So please take it away and share your screen and your knowledge okay. with us. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. I will uh, tell you the latest stories about the Let's see if this works okay, yeah. I will give you an update on how the situation has gone uh, since then, because now we are uh, so far that the first vertical building is planted in the city of Eindhoven. And I will tell you uh, how our part was, what, what our part was in that whole uh, organization and uh, how it all uh, was planted and what, had, what will happen now in the future and how the maintenance will be. Uh, of course, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, it all started in Milan, uh, as referred to by, my, by Matthias in the beginning. The Bosco Verticale was planted in 2014, and that really changed a lot. Um, people started thinking differently about uh, greening the urban areas. And of course, everybody was thinking how they could implement it in their own country. 
Um, and of course, in Holland, things, uh, people did the same thing. Uh, and we contributed with uh, planting of the, the, the Trudeau Tower in Eindhoven. So let's start at the beginning. We went to Italy and we uh, visited the Bosco Verticale three times to see how everything was done and how it was made. We learned a lot. Uh, this photo I've taken myself, uh, taken about, I think it was two and a half or three years ago already. So that's how long this whole organization uh, took to, to, to make these buildings in Holland. As you can see uh, in the screen, all the information about the Bosco Verticale, 780 trees are planted on this building and over 5,000 shrubs, which is a, is a lot. And the most interesting thing is that the, 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 the temperature of the facade is... Uh, is, is, has decreased a lot. So they don't need to use as much air conditioners uh, as they used to. So the, the good things really come out of this to have a better urban space and a livable city. Uh, but now we talk about uh, the technical aspects. Trees were planted in airport systems and I will get back to you on that later. But the most important thing is how does a tree do it with the wind high up uh, in a, on, a, on an apartment building. So we used Anchorage. Um, this is a photo, of course, of the Bosco Verticale. Uh, Anchorage is used inside the tree planter. So a strap was made in a cross over the root ball. But for extra protection, we used, uh, there is a, a, a metal strap used that was put in the balcony above to prevent the canopy from breaking. So when it would break, the, the metal strap would keep the canopy from falling down of the building. It was an extra protection together with the, with the anchorage system in the tree planter. Here you can see the metal strap attached to the, uh, to the tree. Um, and what is also very interesting here in this picture uh, on the, is, is the, the specimens that are used. In Italy, you, you can see a totally different species than we are, that are used in Holland. On the right photo, you can see Crocus ilex. Uh, of course, that's not very winter, uh, winter hardy. So this is not used in our climate. On the left photo, you can see use of a malus, a, a crab apple. Um, and what is interesting to see is that uh, all these crab apples are taken out by the flying gardeners because they won't let they they're not allowed to fall on in on the on the pavements uh, down below because it's too dangerous. So you can imagine the maintenance ha that has to be done uh, to get a, a, a tidy building um, to have everything uh, protected and that nobody gets injured or you don't have a very um, how do you say that? Uh, dirty, dirty floors. What, what I thought was very interesting was the difference between the south and north facade. Uh, the left photo, of course, is the, is the north facade. And you can see a uh, very transparent planting. So the, the trees grow very slow, shrubs grow very slow. Um, and Bueri says this is the most interesting uh, facade because of, of the, the, the slow growing. It's, it's much easier to maintain. We need less pruning and it gives a better look. On the opposite side, of course, the, the south. Uh, a lot of volume, uh, a lot of maintenance is needed. They have to do a lot of cutting, a lot of pruning to keep the plants uh, within the tree planters and not and not not uh, to prevent the branches from breaking out. So a lot of extra help is needed to uh, get a good uh, look and a safe south facade. So it's very interesting to see the big differences what and what Sun does in such a project. Now it's time to go to the Trudeau Vertical Forest in Eindhoven. It was uh, the building has been has started two years ago. And this, this spring, the trees have gone up the building. It started all in December, just before Christmas, the first trees were planted. And last April, the last trees got up uh, the building. They started at the low point and from low they went up with the, the, the big crane that was standing there, uh, yeah, building, of course, the whole apartment building. 125 trees have been planted over there. Uh, and Bueri has uh, done uh, advising and Inbo has done uh, the designing as well. This is also, this building is on Stripe S, as the story was mentioned before. 
Um, it's a very interested area of the city of Eindhoven, an old Philips complex that is now opened up for, for people to live in, and which is a very creative area. And this building really is uh, an extra value for this whole neighborhood. And what's very special that it is for social housing. So people uh, that are, that are uh, living here, they don't have to pay that much. And that's a big difference if we compare it to uh, the, the Milan, the Bosco Verticale, because these are, those apartments, they cost yeah, millions and millions of euros. And people can live here for about six to 700 euros per month rental price. So that's yeah, way different. Um, that's the, so the social housing is very, very important and um, yeah, special to the Trudeau Tower. If we look at the species, the tree species, the, there was a big group or big group, three companies uh, talked together about what trees should, should grow here. Uh, and also the planting specialist from Boeri was, uh, uh, gave her advice, Laura Gatti. And we, we, yeah, we chose, for instance, Cornus Moss, uh, two different types of Amelanchia, Parochia persica, multistems, uh, Acer campester and Acer campester redshine, uh, Prunicea doensis, Sorbus dodong. So all these species that have extra value in, in spring when, when the flowers are, are there, but also that have a really nice autumn color. So it's very nice and attractive all year long. The evergreens are there in the winter, but they are, the evergreens are only in the, in, the, in the shrubs, but the trees are all, uh, yeah, uh, they, they really show the, they are herbaceous. They, they give the spring colors and the autumn colors. The trees were all prepared in airpods to have a very good uh, root ball. Uh, I will explain about it later. Here you can see the multi-stem parochias. They have been planted here. They have been put on airpod two years ago to get this perfect root ball and to, uh, to, have, a, to have no uh, outfall when they were planted. And here you can see a batch of uh, Pyrus uh, salicifolia pendula. They are they are gray. They have gray leaves, and they make you think a little bit about the olive trees in Italy. So that's probably why Bureri really wanted this this species. Well, together with other companies, we were able to make a mock-up. Just we so we we got two uh, tree planters with the exact same uh, measurements as the balconies of the Trudeau Tower. And we tested different uh, substrates. We tested sensors for watering. We tested the irrigation system and tested the mulch layer above. So we did all this testing and it was very helpful. We had a, a year and a half to do all this testing and also to put the sensors, to check the sensors, when was the, when the, to test when the substrate was too wet, when it was too dry, and to test what substrate we could use best for this situation. And yeah, it was so helpful that um, we really decided amongst all companies what to choose. So um, because of the results, it was quite easy to choose the right substrate. And we chose the substrate what let the water, which, which was very, um, uh, which had a lot of oxygen in it and water could, could go through it quite easily uh, because then we could adjust it uh, very easily. The other substrate that we tested had a lot of organic material in it, but it stayed too wet. It was wet all the time. It was wet for a long time. It could stay wet for several weeks. So it did not dry that easily. So we did not choose that substrate, but we chose the one that we could adjust quite easily because once the trees are planted, you can never do that again. So it uh, had to be right the first time. So that's why we chose this one. I already told you before about the AirPod system. Uh, um, well, this Brenda, is what- so, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we, we are still good in time, but could you come to a conclusion maybe that we yes. stick to the schedule? Thank you very much. So this is the AirPod system. Trees were uh, planted in this, uh, in this AirPod system and uh, to get a very good root. Um, and that was really the key thing for the trees to grow in such urban space on this height, um, that we need to make sure that the roots were right because the real quality of a tree is in the ground where you don't see it. 
So um, the airport system is 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 um, let me let me, oh Jesus, <laughs> it's difficult to explain now. I will go to the photos after it's been planted because I think that's more interesting. But I can share information later what the airport system is like because it's quite difficult to explain it in words. I got to show it to you. Here you can see the Buiri is testing uh, and inspecting all the plants. But here you can see the planting of the Trudeau Tower. Uh, so you can see it's really urban, urban area, urban space. And with this balance beam, the trees were planted in the planters. The substrate has been uh, uh, blown on the, on the planters. Um, so the planting, uh, the planting scheme was made by Laura Gatti. So it was a big puzzle and everything came together. So the planting went quite well because of this balance beam. Here you can see Trudeau of the Trudeau of um, Dupre, the, the tree planter who's doing it. And of course, you can see the limited space in the tree planters. So pruning the trees is, a, is, a, is key in this whole, uh, whole story. Um, we have these flying gardeners that go down in the, in the Bosco Verticale. But in this social housing project in Eindhoven, the maintenance will go uh, from the inside so because of price. It's too expensive to go from the outside. So they made a... They will make a schedule that uh, three or four times a year a gardener can come through the apartment and do the maintenance of the planters just because of price. Once a year a flying gardener will go down with ropes to prune the rest of the trees to, to do the real pruning but normal um, the normal maintenance will be done from the inside. Uh, this switch was made only recently because of budget and that and unfortunately that is that is what it is that's something we need to deal with um, you can see some photos of the view you have it's right in the middle of Eindhoven uh, and you have yeah an instant forest right on your balcony uh, with the selection of of tenants um, they they ask people who have a, a green heart you know who really want to live there to have a community that is uh, that can uh, take care of, of the balconies because in Holland they say they don't they like trees but they don't want it in front of their window because of the light that doesn't come in anymore. Uh, so people were selected that they do not think this way and they think otherwise. So um, um, that in the future in future time uh, this will still be a very nice green iconic building in stripe S. Here the last image. And hopefully in five years time, this still everything is green because now we are only uh, have, uh, we only have a few months now uh, experience of watering and everything else. So now it's, it's, it's very important to monitor it in the future. And hopefully we can uh, have this green mill building uh, for, for, I don't know, 25 years. So uh, we are very anxious to, to uh, we'll follow it. Um, step by step um, and we are very confident it will continue to be a beautiful iconic tower in the city of Eindhoven. Thank you. Sorry for my English, it was not that not that great. Thank you very <laughs> much Brenda, no, perfect, um, perfect. Thank you very much. Could you I'm unshare your screen Dutch. please and uh, oh, then sorry, we yeah. uh, do some uh, little questions left. Thank you very much and um, there is a couple of questions in the chat, Irene Uli, do you want to put some of them forward to Brenda? Yeah, I guess uh, one question uh, or several questions could be um, summarized by um, if it's better to have um, shrubs or herbs um, for, the, for it's easier in maintenance and maybe the same effective and what do you do if trees are getting too big? I mean, the roots, not the tree itself. You mentioned it, it will be cut, but um, yeah. This... yeah because, because you will cut the trees from above, you, the, the, the growth of the roots will also be very limited. They don't have to grow that much because you, you keep them in balance as well. If you prune the canopy, then uh, the roots don't have to grow that much uh, to, to give nutrition to the canopy, to the leaves. So it will all be balanced, uh, but you will have a kind of bonsai, uh, bonsai trees. That's what you will have. Uh, the nutrition will go with, uh, it's an organic liquid nutrition that will go with the watering system. So we will give them nutrition uh, so they will get their food. 
so that the, the roots don't have to grow that much. And I think so another was question yeah, was, was sorry, was about the irrigation. Um, how much water does it need, and which uh, water source do you? Um, yeah, the water the water source that is used is from the top so water is collected from the rooftop of uh, the Trudeau tower and what falls down uh, is been put in a big tank under the ground and that is used for uh, the watering but that is not enough because the roof is not big enough to um, give every tree the, the right amount of water especially in in April and May when uh, the spring is there there's more water needed. So then we then tap water is used, unfortunately. And maybe I can conclude with the last question. Thanks, Irene and Uli, for uh, reading those from the chat. Um, Brenda, um, we know from uh, uh, the Bosco Verticale that a lot of studies are done about increasing biodiversity, especially yeah. also insects and biodiversity on the building itself. Do you know anything or what is your expectation, if you can say so already now, about the hopefully positive impact to biodiversity on the larger area around the tower, or is it limited to the building itself? No, it's not limited to the building itself. Uh, and on Stripe, a lot of roof gardens are there. And one uh, that is just across the Bosco Vertical, there's Anton and Gerard, two buildings with a roof roof terrace or that was designed by Bureau Lubbers in Den Bosch. And one roof was rewarded with, uh, or rewarded, there were test, tests done. And that was the rooftop with the highest rate of biodiversity on it. So it, that's opposite to the Bosco Verticale. So there's a lot of biodiversity on Stripe as we speak. So, but this will just uh, add extra biodiversity because of the yeah, the, the varieties, the, the, the Acer, of course, it um, has a lot of insects on it, so it will only increase. Yeah, and sometimes we maybe underestimate the, the stepping stones uh, uh, insects and other animals or seeds can take. Thank you very much again, Brenda, for the update. And in a way, you invited yourself back uh, for over five years to check yeah. how the Trudeau Tower will look so like then. So much to tell, yeah, and 10 minutes is very short, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, I would say. So, dear audience, um, I uh, read very nice feedback from Brenda in the chat. Thanks for interacting, and let's move on to more growing plants in the city will look into urban farming and we have a uh, tim elfring as a next uh, speaker of food kitchen with p h u u d and he will talk about urban farming but not only outside uh, the building in the garden in the public space but also inside so let me check tim are you there hello there Matthias. yes can you hear uh, me yes i hear you very well Right. And you are sharing your screen, I see. So take it away. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we have our own urban farm, uh, which is an aquaponic system where uh, indoor we can grow hyper locally any leafy vegetable. So at the moment, we're at uh, the Kai, that's C A A I in Eindhoven as well, next to the Trudeau Tower. <laughs> It's like 10 minutes uh, distance. And uh, indoor, yeah, we grow our own uh, vegetables. And aquaponics makes use of, I'll show you, fish. So fish fertilize the water for the plants. Um, you have bacteria, they convert the fish feces into nutrients for the plants. Uh, the plants are inside uh, either hydro, um, uh, bits or um, uh, inside the water directly. Uh, they absorb the nutrients and then together with those purple lights you see over there, uh, they grow and they clean the water. So the plants clean the water again for the fishes. So you have a beautiful circular system uh, where in any place or so on rooftops, uh, but, but as well in the basement or yeah, basically, in, even in the Sahara, you can apply this system and uh, grow your uh, leafy vegetables very local. So there's no transport needed, of course. That's, uh, that's uh, a big plus point. So for example, we have a restaurant as well next to the uh, farm where uh, we use some of the vegetables we grow. 
and others we get from an orga organic farmer, uh, yeah, half an hour from, uh, from the restaurant. Uh, but for example, if we order a organic celery, it comes from Spain. So yeah, you can imagine the footprint is very high with that, but also the nutritional value. So every hour a leafy vegetable is harvested, it loses an X amount of nutrients. And we harvest only when we use it either in a restaurant or we sell it to a farm shop, which is very uh, nearby or uh, other restaurants. So at the moment we have, yeah, here's the, uh, yeah, the, the combination of the city and the countryside. So we, yeah, you can be indeed like any empty industrial building in the basement or on the rooftop, you can convert into urban farming. Um, yeah, we're located at the Kai, which is going to be developed soon. At the moment, we have a 200 uh, square meter farm. Um, but when the place is renovated, we're going to expand in the basement uh, up to 40 times the farm which we have now. Um, and we harvest like 100 kilograms of leafy vegetables per week already. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, we, if that happens times 40, you have 40, you have 40, 40 thousand sorry um, kilograms of leafy vegetables and the beautiful thing is well we work with people with a distance from the labor market so uh, or with a disability so we not only help plants to grow but also people and uh, you can see that uh, that social aspect is really fulfilling but also creates such a big impact on society because already we've helped a few people to go back to regular jobs um, because the, yeah, the working environment is very low stress for them, but also very, um, uh, very structured, and especially people with autism really uh, like that environment. Uh, and we really help them to put them in their right spot. So really empower them to, uh, to create value. Uh, we're also um, working at a permaculture farm. It's only eight, Hundred meters from uh, where the Kai is uh, located, where our urban farm is, um, and surrounded at that permaculture, there's uh, yeah just neighborhoods with uh, people living um, uh, who often don't have a big garden. And um, the big plus point of permaculture is that it allows nature um, to work together with animals and humans and to create a surplus of vegetables so again we also want to uh, work with people with a disability over there and uh, provide local uh, villages with yeah very local vegetables so this is the care part yeah which is really important for me is, is cpa this consumer produced agriculture because I heard already um, a few issues about finances, also from Maria, uh, and about maintaining, maintenance, so maintaining the plants that grow on either rooftops. Uh, I've just now been thinking about it as well, because we want to apply that system in our uh, urban farm from October onwards with 10 people. And consumer produced agriculture is basically uh, meaning uh, that we, yeah, like we're going to start with 10 people who pay uh, like 20 euros a week, but they get, get 40 euros worth of vegetables, so fresh vegetables, which they otherwise would have uh, had to buy at the supermarket. Uh, and they help like one or two hours a week. So financially, it's very interesting for them. And they also learn about, uh, about farming, um, they feel a sense of ownership to create like a social community. So it's so beautiful to see um, yeah, how CPA can grow yeah, like a community garden. And I feel if you create that as well for um, uh, places to make urban cities greener uh, and make them edible with uh, perennial, perennials, that are, those are like plants that uh, continuously give vegetables, um, then and you allow people to help with the maintenance, you have and fresh vegetables hyper locally sourced in the city. And at the same time, you have the maintenance. 
So I think that can be a really nice um, thing to think about. I also would love to share this quote. It's uh, from the founder of uh, Permaculture. He's called Bill Mollison. A sustainable system is any system that in its lifetime produces more energy than it takes to implement and maintain it. So again, about that um, uh, maintenance part, if you only have to hire gardeners and they continuously have to put energy into it, um, yeah, it doesn't make sense for me, but if you create like community where the community main, yeah, it applies maintenance to the to the plants and at the same time um, have nature working together in harmony with with animals and with people, and you get fresh vegetables from that. You have like a really sustainable system. Yeah, that was it. If there's any questions, I keep it short and uh, crispy. I already heard that uh, we're on a quite a tight schedule. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, indeed, uh, it's a tight uh, schedule. Maybe you can unshare your screen that we see each other again. Thank you very much. Thanks for your story and the presentation. Mm -hmm. I think there is, um, if you want to switch on your camera. Yeah, perfect, there you are. Is this a virtual background or are you actually in the, in the, in the site? No, no, it's a virtual background, but uh, yeah, it's like uh, I just made a picture as well uh, in between in the break, so. <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, I think there's at least two questions in the chat about uh, um, uh, where's the, um, uh, the energy and water coming from uh, you're using? And can you explain very briefly about aquaponics maybe? Yeah, so uh, at the moment, yeah, it's not completely sustainable. So at the moment we just use regular energy and uh, water from the tap. Um, but when, in one half year, the whole place is going to be renovated, and then we're going to use rainwater and solar panels. So for now, it's it's not possible yet because yeah, everything has to be renovated uh, still. But uh, yeah, within one half uh, two years, uh, we're going to use rainwater indeed. That's going to that we're going to filter and uh, solar panel energy. So um, yeah, then you have a really nice uh, sustainable system. Yeah, and aquaponics. Um, you, you explained, so, uh, of course, how it works, but is, is there anything which you learned so far about the complexity and what you have to watch out especially? Yeah, it's, it's quite simple. There was a, a guy in New York and uh, like in 1970 something, and he's asked himself, like, what if a nuclear bomb would drop now? And um, yeah, like a very doomed scenario. Um, but can I still grow my own vegetables in my little apartment? And then he started experimenting and even the Mayas already did it a few thousand years ago. Um, and he started experimenting and then he found this system where indeed with aquarium you can connect it to bacteria to water and uh, indoor lighting and uh, and the plants then uh, can grow uh, he made that open source and um, uh, yeah there are a few companies around the world uh, who apply that system now uh, but yeah basically you need just fish that do their thing like no yeah. bullshit but fish it <laughs> and um, uh, yeah that those pieces are being converted into nutrients for the plants uh, and you can yeah there's always there's always spring so um, you're not, not affected by seasons and for now we have like one layer you can see it in the back as well of me one layer of plants but um, we're going to go into the basement uh, after one and a half years um, it's going to be five layered yeah okay. and again we want to create that community that's really important so there are going to be a few apartment stores on this plot where we are located now with 700 households. And ideally we wanna have like, yeah, let's say 500 people who uh, pay an X amount a week, get like more financially uh, yeah, interesting benefits from that than if they would have had to buy it from a supermarket. And um, they can help and learn. So even with their children or, or with their grandparents, uh, come and do the harvesting and the sowing and everything. Yeah, I think that's really an interesting approach. Also, like you said, also the people who are involved in this system, and uh, I think it connects very beautifully to what we heard uh, from Angelique about participation processes and rethinking mm -hmm. processes. Tim, many, many things. There's still a couple of questions coming up in the chat, but maybe you can like, um, I think it's easy answers to, to do in the chat. Maybe if yeah. I, I could ask you to do that, then I would thank sure. you very much for your presentation for this moment. Thank you, Matthias. I hope, hope, hope you join us uh, for the rest of uh, uh, this symposium. And I'd like to move on to our next speaker. So thanks again, Tim.
Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, yeah, the water was already mentioned as a topic uh, within uh, the aquaponic system and will go much more on a large scale into uh, the water issue of uh, the sponge city principle. And we'll have uh, Emil Swinnen, who is an associate of Delva Landscape Architects, uh, talk to us about this yeah, meaning of uh, the city as a sponge city. And he's involved in the inception and design of what they self call radical landscapes. So I'm very curious uh, to see these projects and some of them I know, of course, and I'm very delighted that you are here with us, Emil. And Hi. we'll talk about uh, some projects uh, um, but you're working on projects in Belgium and in the Netherlands, and um, we're very curious to hear about these water issues on a large scale. So please take it away. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Very happy to uh, to be here today and to talk a bit what uh, we are, as Delva are involved in. Um, Delva is an office for, for landscape architecture and urbanism. We're like uh, 20 young and enthusiastic uh, people, designers um, who come from landscape architecture, architecture, uh, civil engineering. So it, it's it's a nice mix, uh, indeed, where we try to, uh, in almost like a radical way, uh, in a radical approach, uh, try to green uh, uh, our cities, our environment, uh, of course, for people, but also for nature and, and the ecology uh, around it. Um, and I would like to uh, present our vision or, or how we deal with water, water management systems, etc. Um, in in through, through three projects. Uh, the first project is, uh, is is highly dense. It's a it's an urban urban renewal project. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, a redevelopment of a of a polder, uh, and the third one is. Um, a concept design uh, together with the municipality of Amsterdam for a new wetland park uh, in uh, a to be built neighborhood. Um, but so the first project is located in Den Bosch. It's, uh, it's a provincial city somewhere in the south of the Netherlands. Um, and it's an, an identification uh, project. So as you also see the site, uh, it's just on the edge of the city uh, and there will be a lot of uh, housing program uh, will be added on the site uh, in the redevelopment of it. And what we tried to do once the urban scheme was ready, um, we really try to minimize the, the paved area to, to, to the bare minimum. So it's only needed for, for instance, fire truck access, uh, flows of people, of course, uh, cycling routes, et cetera. But all the rest is green. And together with that green, we actually combine it with, uh, with an extra function, which is uh, the, the storage and the uh, infiltration capacity of the green uh, to uh, also get a feasible water system because municipalities nowadays, which is a very good thing, they have quite high demands on um, being able to store, to infiltrate, to handle uh, um, large and intense rainfalls, which are of course occurring way more often uh, nowadays. So in, in, in this plan, we worked actually with a, like a four step process where we first uh, store water uh, some, uh, on the roofs of the buildings, then we uh, divert it and we let it infiltrate into the valleys. Uh, and when you really have loads of water, then the, the wadis say fill up and then they push the water further, uh, they discharge it further into um, bigger retention zones along the river where the uh, plot um, uh, borders along. And then finally it's being discharged into the river, into the diesel in this case itself. Um, and so here you can see a bit of a schematic uh, uh, version of that. So from the from the rooftops, we store the water with where you have a build up of crates and then the green roof on top. Um, and when, when these crates are full, uh, they can be discharged into the into the valleys in the public space. Um, you can do that also in an intelligent way. So you can store the water as long as you want on the green roofs. Um, and then for instance, when uh, the next uh, big rainfall is coming up, then you discharge them, then they're empty again, and then they can store a new amount of water again. Um, and then from there, depending on where the building is situated along the plot, uh, we send it further into the retention zones of the, of the park along the riverbanks, and then finally into the, uh, into the river itself. And we're in the technical design stage right now. So uh, right now everything becomes uh, becomes real. Also, uh, this is the first site preparations are happening. Um, and so the, the whole plan is actually designed and we succeeded in not bringing in one single uh, drainage uh, system. Um, so everything, just all the water is being discharged gravitationally 
so with uh, with the right slopes and the paving and in the surroundings, all the water automatically flows off towards the valley systems and towards the retention zones. Um, second project is is a project in Lisse. It's a small municipality close to the close to the airport, Schiphol, uh, here also in the Netherlands. And it's a it's a development of 450 homes, uh, residential homes for families and uh, all types of people um, in the Dutch polder. Uh, and that's so we are building in an actually vacant piece of landscape, and it's quite a sensible uh, task, of course, to do. It's also a sensible subject in the Netherlands nowadays. Um, and if you see that polder, then you have to do it. If you want to fill it up, you have to do it with great response, I think. And what happens normally seen nowadays in the Netherlands is that uh, a certain developer comes along and they, they lay out a plan of streets, uh, houses, big backyards um, in a very rational way because it's easy, because it's convenient and it's fast. Um, when we were asked to think about this, uh, this site, we actually proposed a completely other way of, uh, of thinking where we said, no, we think we have to minimize the, the footprint of the buildings or of the build and the infrastructure as much as possible, make as little roads as possible, um, look more towards stacked combinations between parking and building, which is, of course, not a new thing for cities, but within this location, suburban location, it was quite new also on the financial level um, and therefore with with that ambition uh, with that approach we actually freed up 12 hectares of, of, of uh, landscape uh, which uh, could be transformed into a fantastic and super biodiverse wetland landscape uh, where also uh, the water um, can be used as a buffer for the uh, development along it. Um, and so this is a plan drawing which enrolled out of it. We're right now in a pre-design stage. So everything has been fixed. Um, and now we're, we're really detailing uh, on the profiles of the street and then how the water will flow off towards the, towards the bigger landscape itself. And I think that actually what the coolest thing of this project is, is that we need less roads and infrastructure uh, than a traditional development. We also need less site preparations, uh, less sense depletion to preload the site, all that kind of stuff. And again, just like in the in the project in the bus, we're not going to make use of, of drainage, uh, underground piping to uh, discharge rainwater. It's all going via the public domain into the water landscape, which uh, surrounds every uh, residential cluster. And our engineers calculated uh, two months ago that that would save the whole uh business case of the project more than 2 million euros and those 2 million euros that are being saved that can be uh being put into for instance the compensation of the extra cost for built parking facilities uh, but also can be put into the development of the water landscape itself so with a similar business case we're actually uh, achieving a way more interesting attractive plan which is way more climate adaptive and which also deals with water in a very robust and sustainable way um, and it's even, uh, it was even uh, so nice and so ambitious that uh, also the, uh, the provincial institution that uh, regulates all the water system in the Netherlands, uh, that they want to take this project as a pilot uh, within, um, their, uh, within their policy, because uh, the whole area is under lots of stress uh, from, from flooding, uh, from um, uh, lower the, the soil that lowers uh, because a lot of oxidation of the peat and everything. Um, and they actually want to use uh, our site as uh, a buffer where we can have a flexible uh, height level of the water so that when there's a lot of water stress or pressure in the environment, they can let in some volumes of water into our area uh, and then uh, let it out again afterwards. So our, our plan is not only for the residents uh, and all the inhabitants of Lisse, uh, to uh, have nice recreational uh, facilities, um, good ecology uh, of the wetland landscape, but also to regulate uh, the water pressure in the surroundings. Um, um, Emil, uh, sorry, this is Matthias. Uh, you, you're going good. We have two minutes left just okay. to give you an idea. This is a very short one, so that's good. Um, the last one is uh, it's called Strand Island in Amsterdam. Um, it's, a, it's a neighborhood that the municipality of Amsterdam is building uh, in the middle of the, of the Ei, actually, so right on the water. Um, this was the first phase of Eiburg, and now it's sort of the second phase will be built in the next 15 years. They're right now dredging the, the site, as you can see. 
uh, together with the municipality, we designed the urban plan. Um, and then we're also asked to uh, do a sketch design for the, uh, the inner water body, um, which was first in the master plan, just like a, almost just like a big box full of water. And then we said, we have to adjust and manipulate the topography of it uh, to create a way more interesting um, condition for recreation, but also for ecology and also for water purification. Um, because that was actually the main challenge here. The inner water body is used to, again, to buffer uh, and store actually almost 50% of the rainwater that falls on the, on the southern island. So you see that all the water is being diverted into that water body. Um, and because it's mainly still standing water, the, the risk of uh, algae growth uh, in summer uh, was quite high. So with the engineers of Sueco, which is an uh, engineering company in the Netherlands, uh, we looked into solutions, uh, how we can use biological uh, purification uh, and the right planting reeds for uh, oxygen injection into the water uh, to, to ensure that this water quality is being guaranteed all over. Um, and so also here, uh, we use actually a nature-based solution to not only work on the water quality, but also on the water ecology uh, and uh, um, uh, the, the interesting facts of, of biodiversity into the city, but also for water recreation. And that mainly is being done by, again, manipulating the topography of the site and looking into how this transition between land and water is, uh, is being established. Um, this is, for instance, uh, a profile and, and a part in the park where we focus more on recreational purposes. So you can see, for instance, that also uh, the water quality should be just as good that you can also swim in it. Uh, but we have also spots where there is way more focus on natural um, creation uh, with wetlands, uh, with reed beds that uh, inject oxygen into the water and creates more healthy uh, uh, water climate under the water also, of course. Um, and that gives you in total this plan, which is almost like an eight hectare uh, city park, uh, which works for the city because of course it buffers and it cleans the water which comes from, uh, from its streets and its public domain, but also gives a fantastic spot for people to come to, to recreate uh, and the same for animals uh, and birds and, and, and fishes, etc., to uh, create a nice habitat uh, and uh, yeah and enjoy the, the park in, a, in itself in a whole. So I think throughout these three projects for us uh, from Delva, um, we've been, as Dutch people, we've been fighting for a very long time against the water with the polders and the dikes and pumps. Uh, but within these projects, we try to prove that you need to work with the water uh, to uh, ensure a climate uh, resilience uh, neighborhood and to make sure that you have very robust and sustainable solutions uh, for the challenges that we're all uh, facing together. Well, thank you very much, uh, Emil. Very interesting, beautiful project. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, there is, uh, I think, one main question in the chat. Uh, maybe um, we come to that in a minute. Um, I think it is related to the Dutch situation. But I wanted to ask you that, um, of course, you focused on, on the water in the Sponge City uh, uh, presentation. But what's the effect on, on actually the greenery you're, you're planning in the project? Can you, can you look at these projects or on other projects as well? What principal learnings can you take from them? Yeah, um, well, the, the space is often because there's a lot of uh, there's a there's a lot of pressure often from uh, residential like from the program or from uh, financial uh, um, sides of things. So we often we always actually try to combine the green and the blue. And uh, of course, uh, you need to ensure that the the types of green and the types of trees that you plant in certain conditions that they need to be able to survive with uh, larger uh, water bodies or with a more saturated soil. But I think actually the the biggest misconception in uh, in, in, in creating these climate adaptive cities or environments is that, for instance, wadis, uh, that they are often very, uh, often actually in a, in, a, in a dry, quite a dry state. It doesn't happen that much that they are completely saturated and fully wet. So it doesn't, you also don't need to only plant, uh, for instance, like willows who can have uh, very wet feet or a very wet trunk system. Um, in, in the valley itself, you often have a very diverse planting palette and also what we learned from Strand Island with um, manipulating the 
uh, topography in Strand and not on a big scale, but you can also do it in Wadis on a very small scale. You can create a drier and wetter areas within uh, these, uh, these infiltration zones um, to ensure that you can also, also have a very diverse uh, planting. Yes. Yeah, I completely understand that. And I, as I said, was yesterday, I was in Kerkebos, probably a plan you know, yeah. also in Zelf. Yeah, we know it. And um, Holland again, and a lot of wadis were designed there, and they are far too many, and they never are wet because uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a sandy ground, so the water is immediately in the ground, yeah. of course. So um, it's um, also there again what you said to um, it can save money uh, to make a different kind of landscape design. Definitely. Maybe Irene and Uli, can we conclude this one question in various uh, looks on the on the on the chat that this infiltration area is so close to the buildings? Why is that possible? Because apparently in other countries it's not. Why it's possible here? That's yeah, it. because apparently in other countries it's not. Oh, uh, you have to have a distance to the building they drive. Well, uh, never heard of that. Uh, <laughs> in, in this case, in this case, at least, uh, we use the infiltration zones are quite close to the building, so that you can easily divert also the the rainwater from the from the rooftops, and that you can put it immediately into those uh, those infiltration zones. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of how do you say demands and, and policy and regulation in the Netherlands. Uh, but I'm not sure why it wouldn't be possible to do it or what the main reason is that it's being forbidden in, in other countries. Yeah, I wouldn't know too, but maybe we'll, we'll, we'll continue discussion in the chat, but uh, I thought maybe it's because we have different foundation. I like very long poles and stuff like that. So you Who wouldn't knows? get any washings yeah. out of the, underneath the building. And in other countries, the foundation is differently because it's not the river delta like we are. Thanks again, uh, Emil, for your presentation and inspiring uh, projects. And uh, I, I wish you and uh, Delva all the best for much more uh, beautiful work to share with us when we meet again in another context. Thanks again. Thank and um, Irene and Uli, uh, we are now at the end of our second block of one hour fully packed with expertise and knowledge. And I would propose for our audience still going strong with 150 participants joining us um, to take a break again of five minutes. And as I said before, leave your screen, this one email, you can read it later. Please get out of your chair, do some exercise and go outside, look outside. And we are curious, what is the first animal you will see? insects, elephants, giraffes, cats, all welcome. Please take a picture of it, share it in the chat or send it uh, to me in the email. And we are very curious what you're doing and we'll meet back here at 11.47, which is five minutes of break, enough for a toilet stop, coffee or other urgent things. And please don't forget to look at the nature inclusive surroundings. See you again here, 11.47, and then we'll continue with urban mining.
So hello, everybody. I hope you are back with us after the short break. Pia, could you maybe shortly stop sharing your screen that we see if the people are present again? And Emil, is it still your screen shared or um, why do we see, I see only the four participants here on the top of the screen, but I think we are again counting up, counting up 140, 142 people coming back to this third session of this uh, Boku and Biotope City Symposium on Nature Inclusive Green and Climate Resilient cities. So I see some images coming in from your experiences in the break from Jakob, Frank, Sophie, Esther. Well, I'm very curious what we will see on those. And I would like to continue. Irene, Uli, are we okay to, to go on with the symposium? Yes, I see a thumbs up here. That's very good. I also got some images via the email. Thank you very much. We'll all share them with the organizers, of course. And I would like to ask um, uh, our next speaker, uh, Pia Minixover, uh, to come forward and please tell us about uh, urban mining and the circular economy. Um, Pia, you're also connected with your colleague Sebastian Hafner to the uh, University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna. So um, would be cool if you could also see you and not only your presentation. So I hope you have your camera switched on. I still see Amy yes, screen do. here. Ah, here you are. Perfect. Hey, welcome. <laughs> With Hi. a green plant next to you. Good to <laughs> see you. <laughs> Hi. So please take it away. The next 10 minutes are all yours. Yes, thank you very much and hi to you all. So I'm doing the presentation with my colleague Sebastian Hafner and we will continue with urban mining and circular economy. So um, we will include the circular construction and building to the vision of the climate resilient and nature inclusive green city. So urban mining regards the city as a source of uh, raw materials. So this means that the resources that are already built in the city or are available are kept in the cycle. The circular construction economy makes use of this approach and has the goal that all materials obtained in the process are returned to their technical or biotic cycles. So this re represents um, quite a paradigm shift in the construction industry, very much in the spirit of the circular economy, uh, because it means that we are moving away from the uh, linear reuse, uh, the linear use of resources and raw materials to a circular reuse and understanding of natural resources and the built environment. The circular construction economy includes the recovery oriented deconstruction as well as the local um, reprocessing of excavated materials and the reuse of recovered building materials, as well as the production of new building materials. So what this means for the deconstruction and the new building and soil construction um, phases we will discuss in the following few minutes. It is very essential to a sustainable circular construction economy to preserve the local resources. So, if the construction is kept local and the transport distances are very short, the ecological and economic outcome is way better. So additional to the ecological and economic benefits, the circular construction economy also includes the third pillar of sustainability, the social pillar. Yeah, thanks, Pia. I will continue. I hope you can hear me. Um... Where does a circle start in construction? It starts with the recovery oriented demolition uh, of a facility, respectively the returning of the building into its shell state. This is required by uh, law and makes uh, dismantling work necessary. Uh, in this process, also materials get, connect, uh, get collected. For example, non-ferrous uh, materials, metals like aluminium or copper, 
um, which tend to have a high value density um, or other objects uh, who are suitable uh, for reuse. And the collection and the separation of the non-ferrous materials, the non-ferrous metals, uh, the reuse of components are all works that uh, normally doesn't happen in standard demolition. So they create an added value by um, generating revenue and saving disposal costs. So for that, for this, the, the dismantling work can be financed. And this is why the recovery oriented uh, demolition um, carries itself, so to say. So this is this business case uh, we call uh, social urban mining, and for these purposes uh, we uh, found uh, we founded Baucarousel in Vienna. Baucarousel is uh, a cooperation network of socio-economic businesses for the recovery-oriented demolition uh, who apply this um, social urban mining business case. So, but why is urban mining social? How can urban mining be social? Um, it's simple as that demolition works, uh, dismantling the collection and separation of materials is often connected with small scale manual work, which is uh, highly useful for the environment. So at the same time, this also opens up um, opportunities for the labor market because it creates a low threshold access to um, employment and people with disadvantages on the labor market, um, they get employed, trained and qualified for the in the dismantling sector in the field of deconstruction and in the building sector. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, in so social urban mining, uh, it, uh, it's about the work, it's about to work in the building stock, but how can we make design and planning circular? While thinking about this question, we came uh, across this graphic. And uh, what do we see here? Um, simplified, we see um, the larger circle, it's the input circle, it's the resources input for Austria and contrasted with a smaller um, circle it's the output um, of resources which is which means waste so what does this graphic say even if we would be able to recycle 100% of our waste we would be still far away from meeting the demand uh, meeting our resource needs and the continuously growing demand for raw materials, for building, uh, for buildings and infrastructure, the continuously growing stock is not compatible with the natural boundaries of our planet. So what can we do? Of course, we have to close material loops as good as we can. Therefore, we need to focus on um, circular, we have to use circular materials, recyclable materials who are demandable and um, who are harmless of health. But that is not enough. We need to do more than that. And this is why um, the term durability is from such a high importance for us, because um, usage requirements for building an infrastructure um, change constantly. And we need to find a way, uh, we need to design and dimension buildings in a way that we can, um, the, the, the basic structures, the basic building structures can be easily expanded and they don't have to be refurbished or renewed every time uh, the usage requirements change. So the aim is to build in a redundancy where we can allow basic structures to be permanently um, ex permanently preserved and extended. But on the other hand, we allow uh, individual elements like windows or facades to be um, flexible. 
uh, flexible designs in order to enable in, to, in order to enable a kind of openness for usage because every um, generation of course has the right to its own design and we brought an example with us of uh, this um, basic structures who um, got uh, very um, who got um, renewed or who, who got preserved and um, expanded carefully you see the basic structure it's the glass structure and uh, on top uh, the wood construction it's a project Sebastian by... excuse me to interrupt yes. you so bluntly uh, we have three more minutes to go yeah um i'll finish uh, so that's the uh, the third um example of um of circular design it's the usage of renewable resources like wood or clay or um innovations like reduced carbon concrete then I will continue with the uh, third concept, so to say. It's the circular soil concept. Um, the, the initial basic concept is not new. So as early as 1915, Otto Wagner already envisioned reusing the soil for construction sites um, directly. But so uh, although the idea is quite simple, um, the implementation is not yet state of the art, so to say. And in the spirit of the circular economy, we um, or the, the aim of the circular soil concept is to reuse as much um, soil and excavated materials as possible. So we also include um, sand and gravel and not only um, topsoil in, in the concept. This means that instead of transporting the excavated material away from the construction sites in a rather emission intensive way, we or in the worst case, just transport them to the landfill, um, we reuse the soil and gravel and sand on site. So this can happen um, uh, depending on the quality of the excavated materials. Um, for, for example, the sand can be um, used or, or further developed um, for the production of concrete, um, also on, on site with uh, mobile in situ concrete equipment. Um, and the soil um, can be used for plant substrates. So if the quality is good enough and um, uh, with uh, suitable soil additives and a little bit of magic, no, just kidding, a little bit of uh, modeling and logistics, um, we can make plant substrates that can also be used directly on site. And we can also use um, recycled materials. For example, here, um, the brick chippings. Um, yeah, exactly. And we're currently working on a blueprint for the plant substrate uh, production. Um, so stay tuned. And we hope to um, uh, develop it further and simplify it to be able to build flowering turfs and green roofs and or fill planters with the substrates instead of buying expensive plant substrates um, for, the, for the building projects. And it is important to mention that the circular soil concept doesn't only work for one construction site, but uh, across multiple sites, depending on how much excavated materials are actually available and um, depending on the quality. So in the future, we will work on implementing the concept at the urban planning level, uh, which has already happened in, in Vienna with a few projects, um, for example, Wildgarten, um, Eurogate, or also the Bayerup City Wienerberg. And this um, last goal leads to our vision. So the circular building or circular construction um, includes urban mining, recovery oriented deconstruction and circular soil. And it should be an integral part of the climate resilient and nature inclusive green city. So instead of burdening the people and the environment with gray infrastructures, um, soil sealing and uh, excessive linear resource con consumption and so on, um, we hope um, to include um, this, this vision we have um, for the circular building and design in the future. So, yeah, so that um, the city of the future um, can provide all the ecosystem services that we intend with green infrastructures. And we hope that um, further on we can present many more um, practical examples. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pia, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, uh, for this uh, inspiring presentation. And 
beautiful diagrams and the lookout that we will hear more about the research going on. And uh, uh, I share, and I think we all share your your, your final comment uh, that we would uh, want to, a city to deliver all these ecosystem services that we we need. So we are curious to, to keep track on your research and uh, thank you very much. Uh, you. There's a, one little question in the chat, maybe you can answer that via the chat so that we move on with our next speaker. So thank you very much. Um, we have um, three more speakers in this uh, third hour of uh, third session of our uh, symposium here. And the next speaker is uh, uh, Florian Kraus of Green Pass and the Boko, and he will um, tap into a discussion we already started with earlier today, also about uh, uh, costs as an important aspect, but focusing, of course, on monitoring planning measures when it comes to cooling effects in his talk about microclimate simulation. So Florian, I see you there with a beautiful green background. Good to see you. Please share your screen and uh, the next 10 minutes, we are all ears for your microclimate simulation and analysis talk. Thanks a lot, Matthias. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Florian. I'm CEO from Green Pass. And uh, we have heard already about uh, very interesting topics and um, projects um, um, the last hours. Uh, the most important topics are still open. <laughs> so I hope you're still active and um, absorptive. Um, what I will tell you about, um, about microclimate simulation and analysis. And so computer controlled monitoring of planning measures for target oriented uh, results uh, regarding the cooling effects and costs. So um, we have heard a lot. Um, it's basically all about climate resilience. Climate resilience also um, does not only um, consider the issue of microclimate, it's uh, even more. Um, we have heard about uh, water issues, um, air, biodiversity, energy, and also the economic part, uh, which is uh, quite an important, um, which plays quite an important role in their successful implementation of um, green infrastructure. And um, you may ask, um, what does the Biotop City Vienna do? Um, for that, um, we have been happy uh, that we have um, supported and supervised um, the design team and the developers and uh, the project team for the Biotop City uh, with Green Pass. Uh, what is Green Pass? The world's first all-in-one software as a service solution for the holistic assessment of urban environmental impact of real estate and uh, open space, including a uh, green pass analysis and check, uh, allowing design optimization within the design phase um, using uh, key performance indicators to quantify the impact of the ecosystem services and uh, leading to the final uh, world's first uh, official certification standard for climate resilience, which is also um, complementary to green building certificates. You may know like LEED PREM, uh, UGNI, DGNB and so on. And uh, it's also, it also has been developed um, for communication purpose within the last 10 years um, um, within international R&D uh, to uh, enable livable cities. Um, to um, show you um, a little bit more um, um, by the project of the Biotop City, I have prepared a little video uh, which I will start and hopefully will work here. Yeah. I will lower the sound so that I can talk also a little bit um, same time to it. So um, we have heard already about um, yeah, the future aspects um, to design uh, livable cities and the question how they will look like. So um, if you're asking me, I'm not like that, <laughs> better like that. Um, so the Biotop City concept, um, flora, fauna and humans, um, it's quite clear. Um, we have heard a lot about them uh, today. And uh, we also have been happy to support them in terms of climate resilience. So uh, we will make a quick flight uh, to Vienna, even in this COVID and digital times, um, where the world's first Biotop City district has been built. Uh, in the south of Vienna, um, approximately six hectare of large urban development, adjacent to the uh, Wienerberg uh, recreation area, uh, which has been supervised by a trans transdisciplinary team 
a lot of different experts, eight different developers um, who developed this um, innovative urban district, also the world's first, uh, the um, official first uh, urban district, uh, which has uh, finalized um, and awarded by the EBA, New Social Housing, the International Building Association. I'm so happy that um, Amina is joining uh, the symposium today. We have covered six urban challenges, additional three bonus topics, and uh, leading to the world's first official climate resilient district, Biotop City. We have used um, expert simulation software systems, um, the world's leading uh, software envimet for microclimate simulations uh, in the design phase um, to optimize the climate resilience, uh, the use of green space. Uh, also, um, we have heard about uh, the economic um, cost issue. You can see recently that uh, the installation costs of all green infrastructure only um, summed up to approximately 2% of the total construction costs for the Biotop City. So, um, really um, um, not the, the largest amount, providing a lot of uh, features, community gardens, uh, tenant swimming pools, urban gardening possibilities, and a climate-optimized uh, design. We have heard about the maintenance costs, which are also uh, low with approximately 9 euros per square meter per year, and providing and uh, leading to a high thermal comfort, high wind comfort, and an air temperature reduction by up to 2.2 degrees Celsius on a typical heat day um, by the implementation uh, of the green infrastructure and the orientation of the buildings and the use uh, of materials. So uh, you can see here now um, how it's looking from the rooftop. Um, but to go there, uh, it was quite a long way and for all, um, all um, participants. Um, as said, um, we have built digital simulation models um, for the Bite of City. You can see here six different scenarios, uh, the planning scenario and optimized scenario. We also have compared it to the initial situation and uh, with reference scenarios, worst case, moderate case and the best case scenario. You can see uh, outcomes are heat maps. Um, red means hot, blue means uh, good thermal comfort and um, very pleasant. And uh, the results, uh, you basically can summarize them are shown by this uh, infographic. Um, we have heard about this 2.2 um, degrees Celsius air temperature reduction, um, future-proof and sustainable um, urban district. Um, nature inclusive um, sponge city features. Um, so the Biotop City performs um, with um, more than 130,000 full bath tubes after rain events. So a lot of water can be kept uh, on the area. Uh, the leaf area uh, in total sums up to 18 hectares um, from all vegetation or as much as 25 soccer fields. Um, we have heard already that it's car free, at least um, over the ground. So uh, cows um, are under the ground with some exceptions. And um, what um, um, and it's very important also the perceived temperature because we do not feel air temperature, we feel the perceived temperature, the physiological equivalent temperature, which can be reduced by up to more than 20 degrees on a typical heat day um, by providing shade through green infrastructure carbon storage so you can fill uh, more than uh, 23,000 uh, 23, uh, 23, um, filled balloons. Um, there are more than 280 new trees representing an area of two hectare natural forests. Um, only 57% or 57% unsealed surfaces um, while, min while minus 40% less unsealed areas compared to before. We have seen the rooftop pools, um, hotel, school, and kindergarten, which are provided um, by the best biodiversity and um, purpose and promotion, like and bee and bird pastures, breeding and nesting spots. And 
is all only for an, uh, investment costs um, of approximately 100 small uh, electric vehicles uh, like the um, VV um, ID4. Urban mining, we have heard about that, um, that building materials have, has been uh, reused. Um, we also have heard about um, minus 28 degrees cooler surfaces um, through the use of, of facade greenery and uh, green infrastructure. In total, more than six, uh, six hectares new green space or as much as nine soccer fields, urban gardening possibilities, uh, the maintenance costs for green can be compared um, 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 to a Netflix annual subscription uh, model for each um, um, person who is living there. And uh, yeah, total of um, green walls and green roofs, um, the total amount of green roofs and uh, green walls has been implemented as well as community areas. So summarized, uh, Biodop City um, shows um, how climate resilience can work, that it's climate resilient, uh, that it's also green and uh, nature inclusive. We have heard already about um, the Greenpeace Platinum Award and uh, the vice mayor of the city of Vienna, um, where we are happy um, to um, award it uh, together with her to the, to the real estate developers and uh, to have um, yeah, this um, pioneer project, um, especially for social housing in Vienna because um, two thirds of it are social housing and um, Therefore, we are really happy um, to, to have supported them uh, within the, the project phase. If you're interested, uh, you can find more information uh, on our blog, greenpass.io um, slash blog, um, where you also can find further links um, to further uh, information. And uh, because there are also some architects and uh, designers uh, still with us, um, I also want to raise um, the possibility um, to become an urban climate architect. Um, what is it? Um, we train partners, uh, architects, designers, landscape architects to so-called urban climate architects. Um, we are an online training, which is actually transforming to a video on demand service, where you learn about urban climatology, uh, green infrastructure, and the Greenpeace system so that you can easily use it um, by yourself, um, by your individual projects, to um, show the performance and impact uh, of your real estate and open space um, to really um, provide and um, design a future-proof and uh, climate resilient um, 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 architecture and uh, urban development. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank uh, you very much, Florian. And uh, thanks also for ongoing uh, uh, links uh, leading further for the designers, architects and urban planners here in the uh, symposium and indeed we are still going strong with 130 participants so thanks for your contribution maybe you can unshare your screen that we uh, see each other again thank you very much and um, very interesting and I think uh, uh, yeah this will be done much more in the future and uh, probably many of uh, the people in the audience will contact you um, there's one or two little questions in the chat, which I would m uh, like to ask you if you could answer them in the chat briefly, and then we move on with uh, the second uh, Florian and the last Florian ever actually in, uh, in this program here, Florian Reinwald uh, uh, of uh, the uh, ILAP uh, Institute of Landscape Planning will speak to us on regulations and as uh, Florian Kraus said yeah there's many important topics still not addressed yet and one of them is indeed regulations laws the building laws that actually affect these developments we are talking about so uh, Florian Reinwald uh, you you had um, not only uh, the, the final position in these 10 minute talk series but you also let us know that your name comes from the Latin word of florus which means flowering or flourishing. And I think this is almost a compulsory name, of course, for a speaker on this symposium. Um, so we are very curious about your work with uh, Green Force Cities and the ILAP, uh, where you are the technical manager of the International Center of Excellence for Urban Green and the CEO of Green Pass. So I'm very curious and I'm happy to give you the floor for the next 10 minutes to talk about regulation laws and these aspects that are of the highest importance uh, for these 
cities in development we are talking about. So I hope I can, you can hear me and we can see you now and the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, well, in the, there was kind of a mix up. The other Florian is the CEO and um, I'm a Florian from the Institute of Landscape Planning from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences, but doesn't matter at all. Oh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. <coughs> That's what you get. Only two with the same <laughs> name and then immediately it happens. So yeah, but please excuse us, both of you. Being a CEO isn't that bad, so I, will, I could live with that. Yeah, um, well, I'm the last presenter and that's always very hard, especially if you got the topics of laws and building codes, but I will try not to bore you too much. Um, a short outline of my presentation, I will start with um, some general remarks regarding obstacles implementing green, climate resilient and nature inclusive uh, cities. Then we'll introduce a kind of theoretical concept we developed to structurized analysis of those implementation obstacles. Maybe you heard the term of climate proofing once before, and then of course, um, some flashlight out of the practice. What are the real obstacles we are facing when we try to implement green and nature inclusive cities? And then of course, some concluding remarks well, the presentation is based on a lot of different research projects where we always try to find ways to also legally implement the good ideas we heard today. Um, yeah, but there's a lot to tell, so let's dive right in. What we also have, especially in Austria, we like a lot of strategies. So we've got climate change adapt strategies, we've got climate change mitigation strategies, we've got um, green infrastructure, nature-based solution strategies, we've got planning strategies which try to incorporate um, green and climate resilient uh, implementation. And then of course we have got different implementation strategies on national level, federal, state level, city level, and of course like manuals like the uh, Biotop Cindy manual. But as we all know, paper is patient and there is an implementation gap um, to really bring down measures to earth. So we developed within a research project, um, a theoretical framework to analyze um, what's necessary to really um, make climate proofing to develop climate resilient and green cities. Um, I want, didn't, don't want to go into detail because otherwise I will spend my whole 10 minutes on explaining that illustrations. Just pose two major questions we were asking ourselves. One is, are the planning processes and tools suitable? And of course, we always need framework conditions that should be suitable to implement uh, green cities. We will focus on just one aspect of those many framework conditions that have to be fulfilled. We will have a closer look on the legal aspects. Um, but first, starting with some general shortcomings regarding the implementation of green and climate resilient planning. Well, the core question is, do we know what we have to do? And there's still a lack of data. Um, we heard a lot about different um, forms of data, how to analyze, to quantify um, the effects of urban green infrastructure. But what's most crucial that most of these um, instruments are not mandatory. They are not uniform. Every city makes their own stuff. Every federal state makes their own stuff. So nothing could be... Um, Compared to there are no standards at all. So there is, of course, a need of change also regarding the legal framework. And <clears throat> another critical challenge is, well, it's, I think, still an unsolved problem, a problem in planning. So if you've got any ideas to overcome the shortcoming of how to incorporate future developments in actual planning, please pose it in the chat. And this is a critical point because the, most of the planning laws in Austria, this is actually not taken into account at all how to deal with future developments when you have to decide right now. And that's especially for decision makers, very uh, uh, 
difficult to decide under uncertainties. So another central challenge, and it's well, maybe an Austrian point of view, we've got a very decentralized planning system. So we have got nine different planning laws in such a big country as Austria. And what's also very important, especially for the administrations that they have the aims anchored for uh, in planning laws. So we analyze within a project all the different federal states planning laws regarding the implementation of climate change mitigation and climate change adaption. Um, yeah, but most of the planning laws in Austria, meanwhile, implemented uh, climate change mitigation as an aim, but regarding climate change adaptation, only three out of nine federal states planning laws take care of that aspect. And what's also the point, climate change adaption is always just voluntary, but not obligatory. They give the municipalities the possibility to work with the problem, uh, to deal with the, those aspects, but not obligatory. And another question was, so are the processes and planning instruments uh, suitable we are using? And in principle, the answer is yes. As we have seen today, we know how to plan climate resilient and green cities but in reality, there are some obstacles. So let's uh, closer look on some examples. The first one um, deals with adaption in public space and the incorporation of people um, doing adaption. Also heard quite often today how important it is to incorporate lay persons into the adaptations of our cities. So we accompanied, we had a research project in the Seestadt Aspen, maybe some of you know one of the biggest uh, um, development projects in Austria and the whole Europe, I think. And yeah, there are a lot of initiatives already going on there. We have made a map collecting the different approaches, the initiatives, the different public spaces they are using. And we accompanied also some project the people wanted to develop there. And one quite simple idea at the first place is Let's grow wine. Um, um, inhabitant of the building in the back um, wanted to plant wine on a sandy uh, area in front of the house because it's very windy there and the sand always blows around. So he thought maybe a greening would be interesting. Then he handed this project in at the city administrations and after rally through different planning departments of the city of Vienna, he finally got the okay. But you have to sign a contract. And reading the contract, the initiator refused to implement the project. He would be responsible for everything, has to pay a security deposit, has to pay uh, rent uh, for using the public space. And reading through these three pages, um, he decided not to implement the project. Uh, that, um, but finally, we found a solution for those problems after some two years, but the initiator isn't interested any longer, which I could understand. But at least for future projects, it should be easier um, to uh, implement those projects. And actually, the, implement, uh, the inhabitants are implementing other projects very successfully in Seestadt Aspen. So one obstacle to, which has to become Solved. Florian, Another... sorry, Florian, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we've got three minutes left. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you you yeah. know what that means if I'm saying yeah. something. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Another uh, challenge in the city of Vienna is the so called Gärtnerische Ausgestaltung, the horticultural design, or another term that sealing of these areas is only uh, necess uh, possible to the necessary extent. But nobody defined what is a horticultural design and what is to the extent necessary. So we found examples like this um, single family house in Vienna um, where all the not built up areas should be greened, but everything is sealed. The drive is sealed, the so-called front garden is sealed, the garden is sealed up to 95% uh, is sealed up. If you've missed it, that's the connection remaining to the soil. Um, so of course, this has to be changed. Um, and also the city of Vienna is working on that too. We are uh, into a research project and they made uh, working groups to change the planning law. Um, same problem with, with another city in Austria. We developed together with the city of Salzburg a green and open space factor 
um, made a manual how to implement it in planning processes uh, on the level of zoning planning, uh, finished everything, and then we heard, Yep. Nice, but cities are not allowed to issue corresponding ordinances. So the legal basis must first be created. And luckily, good news that the federal state, the state legislature is ready to make changes um, to change the federal planning law and they started a working group. So to come to the conclusion, maybe start with a statement I hear quite often. Um, it's a German statement, and a Bauordnung ist keine Baumordnung. It works better in German than in English. That means a building code is not a tree code. Um, but as we have seen, almost all planning laws already take climate change mitigation into account, and we are in a good way that they also take climate change adaptation into account. We've got some, for example, some new dedication categories in land use planning, like um, sustainable residential areas or clear, clear, clearance areas for climate change adaptation. So to conclude with a nautic metaphor, regularly Helga Fassbinder is using, at least the tanker is moving. It takes some time and effort, but at least it is moving. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Florian, uh, with the outlook of an oil tanker, if I see correctly, I'm not sure. <clears throat> so we need to need different references, but we get the idea, of course. Maybe you can unshare your screen that we can see each other again. And I was, um, uh, thanks for, for uh, the uh, insights you have found out and, and the practicalities and the examples. And I think I saw uh, somebody in the 22nd uh, district in Vienna on a bike tour who had illegally planted wine on the house. And <laughs> I can tell you that uh, the, the grapes are nice and he uses the leaves for a field, what is it called, field wine leaves. He just didn't ask. And it's a social housing rental. Mm -hmm. So maybe... There's also other aspects that uh, lead to more biodiversity, nature, inclusivity in the city. I was wondering from to ask you, because things have to change and it takes uh, some time, but uh, we found out with the research Next City that did, for example, that there is also other countries that have uh, already uh, tackled and addressed this topic before. And... Um, I know something from Seoul, for example, uh, which in, uh, enables you to make a more building surface if you contribute to biodiversity. And um, same goes for Sweden with a point system. Also, 12 municipalities in Amsterdam are currently mm -hmm. developing or practicing a point system for nature inclusive. So no building permit without enough points. Can you tell a little bit about the outlook? Where are we going? What would be inspiring to look at when it comes to laws and regulations? Well, as you mentioned, quantifying is the approach most cities like to use, like these green open space factors, or we also have in Austria these Klimaaktiv criterion, where it's well, it's kind of certification, it's not pinning in the law. And I think that's the, the point where we should get to that it's obligatory. Because if something is mandatory, well, dealing with public goods is always a problem in, in that context, because, uh, yeah, the not in my backyard is, of course, a central challenge, and therefore it has to be obligatory. And also the municipalities tell us that it needs to be obligatory, because otherwise they expect, well, if I do something and I want more from my investors, people will move in other cities. So therefore, there has to be kind of regulation and obligation, which treats everybody equal. And I think that's the to the point where we should get. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm not sure we we uh, we have to check Uli and uh, Irene how many policymakers and municipality people and on government people we have in the audience, but um, I think that's a, a clear statement you're making here, uh, Florian and I can also tell from the Dutch situation that when we started like eight years ago, the government said principally, no, 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 we are just facilitating and inspiring. <laughs> and we have seen a huge mm -hmm. turn in that in the last yep. years because yep. they realized and actually were asked by housing corporations, by developers to come up with clear guidelines, mm -hmm. compulsory re regulations, 
also to ensure equality when it comes to tendering processes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So not to be vague and inspiring, but to be clear and demanding like uh, many other countries have done before. And that leads to more quality in the public space and in these cities, the future we're working for. Thank you very much, Florian, again for this contribution. And um, um, concluding the second big uh, block in our uh, symposium with 10-minute uh, talks that basically addressed all aspects of uh, these nature inclusive climate adaptive and green cities within this symposium. We are ending uh, the symposium with a project we look more in detail to and we have uh, Jeanne Astrup Chauveau. I hope I correctly pronounce your name, Jeanne. And you will tell us about the floating university. Um, um, you have been involved there uh, since the beginning of this project, uh, together with the uh, Raumlabor, the Architect Collective. And now you are also part of the board of the university. And you are studying architecture at the uh, UDK, uh, the University of the Arts in Berlin. So we're very much looking forward to uh, learn more about this concrete project as a conclusion of our symposium. So I hope you can hear me and you can share your screen with us. Um, yes, I can. And now you should be able to see my screen. Yes, there you are. Perfect. Great. And thank you. Screen sharing works perfectly. Take it away. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, inviting Floating University, which I represent now and for introducing me, but I also need to make sure that people understand I'm not on the board of the university, I'm on the board of the association of the floating, um, because spoiler attack, it's not um, floating and it's not a university, but I will let you uh, know more about the project. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's, um, it's an actual place in, in Berlin in a water rainwater retention basin in Tempelhof. Um, you can see it here on this map and it's um, recalled like collecting the water from the Tempelhof airfield and one big street that uh, joins it. And um, here also a closer look how it um, looked like at least in 2018 because the image is not that actual but um, you can see um, on the southern um, uh, Part. In fact, the water, the rainwater is collected there and comes into this retention pond and flows out on the northern to the Lamba Canal, so the water uh, in Berlin. And um, you can also see from here that the, the space is, um, of course, inhabiting a lot of different species. You see these greens, algae that were very present in 2018, um, the reed beds through which the water flows before going out. But you can also notice that on the side, um, the entire pond um, being a retention pond and not an infiltration pond is uh, paved with concrete flooring. So it is a quite artificial landscapes, landscape that um, collect the polluted water, um, polluted rainwater of Berlin. On the outskirts, you can also probably discern uh, some small uh, community allotment gardens that are closest neighbors and um, also decisive um, actors in our relationship to the city. Um, exactly. And then um, important to know about the site is that it, um, it was paved in the 1930s uh, by the US uh, Army. And since then it has remained uh, close to the public as a city infrastructure. Um, and in 2018, the city of Berlin uh, wanted to uh, relocate the retention pond in order to, well, um, have this very prominent space in the city as a valuable um, real estate asset, I'd say. But um, in 2014, the Tempelo referendum, where the people of Berlin voted against the construction of the Tempelo airfield, um, also protected this area that is attended to it. Um, and therefore it remained uh, the place that it was um, until 2018 when um, the Berlin Collective Raumlabor uh, decided or started negotiation with the tenants, a company that administrates both 
the building of the temple of Air, temple of airfield and this uh, retention pond that called that is called temple of gambia which is an important actor to remember for the the end of this uh, presentation and what you what you can see now is the way the architecture looked like in 2018 so it does all like most of it has now been removed and it looks very different today but um, I wanted to show you also the way the look, the space evolved over the year, because it's also very linked to the way we interact with the ecosystem of the place. And um, although I also wanted to focus now on our relationship with the ecosystem, um, it's very difficult to separate it from the program that has been happening there since three years now. For we consider ourselves and uh, understand our practice here as um, intertwined with a nature culture site, which is very, yeah, which we inhabit as much now as any other species. And um, this is uh, the program that happened there in the first summer. So it was uh, initiated by Ram Labo and it was a full on open summer where the place was for the first time open to the public and focus were set um, on experimenting, on learning processes, uh, on urban practices as well as on water filtration. Um, so we wanted to interact with the, with the water that is uh, collected in the basin and not only um, be a parasite to the site. So we wanted to interact with it and um, design this water filtration system, which uh, collected the rainwater and threw out different um, um, filters that were, for example, uh, um, bathtubs that were hanging within the structures that was already integrated in the design uh, with plants or with sand. We also had active carbon, um, mushrooms. Um, well, all of this uh, to, to filter the heavy pollutants that, that are present in the water of the basin. And finally, we also worked with um, Scientific in Berlin, uh, built this moving bed reactor with bacteria that also treat the water in a way. Um, and finally, uh, this was also very performative. So it was a, also a way to engage a discussion with visitors and people interested in the topic. And we um, also got the chance to get the water tested and realized that our goal were not reached as we could not uh, obviously not properly uh, drink the water or not even for most of it uh, bath, bath in it. But um, still we saw a lot of improvements and uh, this all we could take into account for the, for the years to come in order to improve these systems. Um, exactly, but the most important and uh, interesting uh, fact about this water testing that we did after the first summer was that the water, uh, all the effort we made into treating the water were very small in comparison with the active filtration of the reed bed um, that uh, the water has to go through before exiting the pond. So knowing this, um, after the first year, there was a big uh, shuffle within, like a reshuffle of, of actors within the project and the team and the artists of the first summer uh, decided to come together as an association. Um, which since then is still happening. It's still a process. It's, it's quite uh, long, probably some of you know, um, and also very, very interested, interesting. And um, we've still been inhabiting the place now since 2018, but important to know about the Flouting University is that um, it really fo follows a, a yearly cycle where we kind of expand in the summer and in retreat during the winter. So the, the structures are inbuilt or um, the place goes to kind of a hibernation state, but uh, it's still very beautiful. So I thought I will also share this with you. Um, until 2019, where as you can see now, the structures are much, much smaller and which, where, which hosted the first edition of um, the Climate Care Festival. Uh, curated by two members of the association, where we decided to put where, where the basin, the space of the basin was seen very much as a place where, where it is possible for us um, humans to grasp a bit the, the changes that are occurring in the world and the 
climate, uh, climate emergency um, and focused on many topics. Some of them have been uh, already presented today as such as um, a relationship to the env environment, us as caretakers, um, experiments with material, but also environment and personhood. So all of these topics being um, presented and discussed um, in 2019. Um, and then 2020 uh, was much more quiet in terms of public program, obviously, um, but it was also the occasion for the association to um, get together and collect knowledge, like um, day-to-day -day knowledge uh, about the place and also wishes how the place should expand in the upcoming years. Um, so we decided within the association to have this participation-based design process, um, gathering uh, wishes and, and discussing with the members that are, some of them are artists, but we also have biologists, soil experts, uh, architect, designers. And one very important uh, outcome of this that was uh, what you can maybe see now on the screen, that one of the most important things to include in the planning is the dynamic of the surrounding ecosystem. These dynamics will not only continue, but accelerate the ecosystem of the basin, which today is comparable to a lake ecosystem, is about to race to a new state because the mud has extended and is ready to be colonized by the reed, the willows. And it is this moment where we realized that we were not only observing um, the ecosystem year after year, but like we could really see it growing and expanding and expanding around us. So around the structure that we built um, and we're not only uh, visitors, but really actors of the site also in this way. And after that, it was important to understand that everything we built had to be carefully arranged. So not to take away too much space from the natural growth. And what you can see here is um, the master plan or the way we decided then to arrange the space with um, uh, taking into account that some part of the basin remain very dry and are only momentarily flooded, but has others have constant flow of water. Um, and we decided to build either in one, in one or the other, like remaining into the what we call open water, where the, the sediments do not settle and we would not take away mud or places for plants to grow, uh, or the dry area, which anyway is less uh, hospitable. Um, in the end, we went for the dry area and that's where we decided to um, keep on building um, for the summer. Uh, what you can see, the white building here, maybe you can see my, my mouse, um, is where I'm sitting right now. And this is standing since 2018, it hasn't moved. And um, exactly, now this is, how it looks today. That's the floating university in 2021. Um, as you can see, us being outside of the water, um, we also uh, could host this year again, the second edition of the Climate Care Festival, which, is, which this time focused on the concept and notion of rewilding in its many definition, uh, not uh, like, trying to show so the diversity of approach to this topic um, and which for us is very important because um, we also learned uh, a year ago that the owner of the site, Temple of Gambia, has big, big plans for the pond. Um, they tolerate our presence for now, but they want to um, renaturalize the basin not being very clear what that means and that uh, what it would mean for the site. But what we think is that they want to transform this retention pond into an infiltration pond. So having the water sinks into the ground rather than flow into the uh, canal, which is understandable, but um, also uh, since we learned that they have to pay a lot of money to get the water into the canal because the water is not filtered. filtered. Um, nevertheless, having the polluted water sink directly into the ground sounds quite um, disturbing when you know that the groundwater in Berlin in this uh, area is very close to the surface. So 
if it would require a lot of uh, filtration uh, systems, uh, layers of sands or, or carbon, which is also cost uh, demanding. So we are quite uh, skeptical about it. Um, and we decided to, to have this also festival about rewilding in order to start a discussion with, with them um, and see where, what is our place in this, uh, in this process, how to, how to start the discussion. Um, our main argument, um, the, their main argument being that we are in the way of the, of the infrastructure and um, the argument of the um, local environment uh, are also taking place away from nature in a sense. But uh, our expertise of the place also being that by including the material that you can find on site, for example, the reeds into the construction, um, um, the mud, it uh, showed also along the years that the, um, the natural growth of the basin adapts around our structures and that they are even uh, um, supporting the growth of, of the ecosystem. For example, you can see here um, that the willows have been, take, have been taking roots around the structure where the mud accumulates uh, faster. And therefore the ecosystem, as we say, is transforming from this lake ecosystem to maybe a humid uh, forest or uh, um, a grassland. And this ecosystem change being, of course, uh, very high in biodiversity and very active in dynamic systems. So that was it. It was a, a very uh, short jump into the floating university and where we are at, at the moment. It's all very moving and it's also almost over since uh, uh, September, October, autumn, fall is coming and we will in build soon the structures that are here. So I invite you all, if you can, to come to Berlin and. Um, see it by yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlet, for this uh, inspiring presentation. Thank you. Uh, maybe you can unshare your screen so that we uh, see uh, each other again. Um, and I see we're still going strong, although it's uh, a Friday for uh, afternoon activities. 111 people still with us here. I have a question to you. Um, as you said that um, this is maybe temporary and developments are changing and if I look at the city where I live Amsterdam for example housing prices is going up 8,000 euro per square meters uh, to buy an apartment and um, this uh, idea of porosity is a, a term that comes back more often. We coined it with Next City as porosity, of course, for plants and animals in the city, but also in a more philosophical term, it has been used more often that a city has to be porous and offer porosity for initiatives like this floating university, for example. So I wonder in the context of your experience, um, we need porosity, I think, and, and what is needed? What can cities do? What can we demand? What, give we, what can we give them as an advice to enable initiatives like these that are so important for city life? Um, I think they need to be bold and a bit brave to have these crazy people that come to you and say, I want to open a rain retention basin and uh, make it open for the public. And they need to... Yeah, they need to make the step of saying yes in the first time, which um, too does not happen that often. And um, even for us now, even though um, the project has been granted a month ago, the Golden Lion of the uh, Venice Biennale, it has a lot of recognition. And, and also, it, I mean, when you talk to the people here, you feel that it's, um, it's awakening a lot of thoughts and a lot of uh, opti optimism. Um, somehow we are still debating now with the politic of Berlin um, because it's all unsafe, all very precarious that we can remain. So we're kind of wondering what do you need more? What kind of proof do you need more? Um, so uh, the, I don't know, I think the one advice would be um, try it just, uh, yeah. 
go with the crazy initiatives. Yeah, and be bold and daring. I hear you say mm. this, and I think that's a good call to make also at the end of uh, this symposium. Thanks again very much for the presentation Thank and uh, for the from the side report actually because you're actually sitting there and. Uh, mm -hmm. With perfect internet connection, not always the yes, case in Germany. My 2021. experience. Yeah, you. look at that. You deserve to uh, see look, now. Here we are. Perfect. Yes, well. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I think we will come to a conclusion. And dear audience, as you have found out, and um, we are still within the time frame, but we don't have a lot of time for discussion. I would like to address um, the audience. If you have questions to our speakers, please put them in the chat. And I would like to challenge also, uh, like Jeanne said, uh, to challenge and uh, our speakers and ask them to be bold. And we had a summer of uh, fires and heat islands and we had flooding. And now we talk about nature inclusivity. So there must be no regret measurements which anybody should do immediately. And I would like to challenge our speakers. What is the top number one no regret measurement that could be implied in any project, be a building, be an area development? Who has some golden tips for us and our the audience at the conclusion of uh, this symposium? I'm wondering, we talked about boldness with Shane and about daringness, so an attitude. But I think there must be spatial things. Uh, Florian, Sebastian, Pia, maybe Emil. What is the, what is it that anybody should do immediately and no regret? I'm curious to hear that. We use Green Pass. <laughs> <laughs> we, we learned about Green Pass. Thank you for reminding us of that. Any other ideas? I think the implementation of green infrastructure and nature-based solutions uh, is crucial um, for us all, for humanity, to really um, adapt uh, our urban areas successfully. And uh, yeah, there is no excuse um, to don't do it. And um, that's a good statement. Any anyone else of the speakers? Whom can I challenge? And when I think of Vienna, and when I think of what Pia um, had in her presentation, um, I think the top gold measurement would be safe soil because mm -hmm. we lose it on yeah. the long term yeah very important to address soil again yeah any other speaker come up we are in the hot phase of summing up most important uh, measurements i would um, suggest uh, to unseal everything what is possible and uh, to ask the city to prohibit it sealing that's really a, a problem because uh, sealing is going on. Uh, yeah, unsealing. And, and we know now that it's even cheaper to unseal or to not seal. That's a good one. Helga, I come to you back in a minute for concluding words. Any other top tips from the speakers? I can't imagine that there is more. <laughs> I have another one. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, well, uh, try to convince the uh, fire, uh, what's, what's Brandwehr, what is the uh, fire protection, uh, that green is not uh, dangerous. It, it, uh, <laughs> it will not uh, go up in, 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 in fire. Uh, and there is uh, uh, sufficient of proof also by the uh, Boku. Uh, so the fire protection, protection regulation should be modified. That's also a very clear call. I was uh, wondering if Emil is still with us because he had a, a clear statement also on uh, the money aspect, uh, which is always important in practice. And also we know from many more projects that if you cleverly think about them in terms of climate adaptivity and nature inclusivity, it doesn't have to be more expensive in building. And there's coming more research showing that, and it's not more expensive in maintenance many cities uh, actually save money by adding uh, and contributing to biodiversity increase. So I think that's also a takeaway. Look, um, look into that. 
if you're working at a municipality or a housing corporation. Um, yes, if we don't have any golden top tips, Helga, I think it's uh, to you as the as uh, the organizer of this fantastic symposium full of experts and expertise and inspiring projects to give some closing remarks what what do you say 20 years after the first conference well i i'm <laughs> i'm only one of the organizers uh, harry van helmond and this messing team of the book who they have done perfect work on this and i'm really impressed by by the uh, series of really uh, um, detailed um, suggestions and, and, and research and experience that's that's the growth a, a bit different between uh, 2022 uh, because at this time on this um, conference I nearly found speakers that was so new and now there is not only a broad public who is a tent of what is going on, but also there is quite a lot of experience and knowledge, and it's it's uh, the task of everybody uh, just to talk constantly about what has to be done. And uh, this uh, symposium for me it was a really wonderful uh, run through the different <laughs> in 10 minutes <laughs> uh, uh, through the uh, the different topics which is now um uh, yeah it, the the whole general uh, theme is divided in quite a lot of different topics which has has to be done and this is uh, so far that we we just we we could turn around the big uh, tanker and well this takes time i one read that uh, so, uh, the, these big tankers have a radius of 20 of 23 kilometer in radius to to make a 100 percent youtube turn yeah so that's that's an urban scale indeed and i think we should come up with a post oil uh, uh reference uh for that to be honest but uh, thanks for concluding uh, this uh, uh with an enthusiastic uh, uh comment i think which is completely appropriate so thanks again for the speakers who have been um deliberately selected for their expertise and excellence thanks again speakers thanks for joining and i briefly would like to conclude with looking at uli and irene uh, we will have this online, you will distribute uh, presentations, how will this go on and how can we spread the knowledge even further? Uli, Irene, can you let us know? I think it would be good if you um, look continuously at the Biotop City homepage. We will try to um, cut the videos um, on the weekend or probably on Monday or Tuesday. And so um, then they will, will, will put them on YouTube, but um, provide the link via the Biotop City journal so that's the best where you can have a look um, if you don't get the biotop city journal newsletter subscribe to this <laughs> and so you won't miss anything i guess <laughs> well perfect so the website again it's of course mentioned everybody knows has registered there so follow that for updates presentations videos Thanks, Uli and Irene, for the wonderful collaboration. Thanks to all speakers again. Thanks, uh, Harry and Helga, for inviting me to help uh, moderate uh, this fantastic uh, morning. I think we learned so much, and uh, I hope we will have a much wider range with the recording of it to spread the knowledge and work on this yeah, climate adaptive, nature inclusive, and green city. Thank you very much. Yes, th to thank you for this really perfect moderation. Ah. Really. <laughs> Very seriously. Congratulations um, for the for the serious moderation. Thank you. We are two minutes over time. My German mother could live with that, I think. So we are almost on time. Follow the website. 
have a good lunch, have a good demonstration if you do that, and have a very inspired Friday afternoon and weekend. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.